All right, welcome uh, everyone, board members, foundation staff, guests. This is the 487th meeting of the National Science Board. Uh, we're convened at 10 a.m. Uh, Eastern time on February 21st, uh, 2024. Uh, as is our now our tradition, this is a hybrid meeting. Uh, we have some folks attending in person and some on Zoom. Uh, all the open sessions uh, will be live streamed uh, on the board's uh, YouTube channel. Just a reminder for those of you attending in uh, person, make sure you're logged on to Zoom, uh, but keep uh, your speakers, your microphone, and your video off and use the raised hand feature so I can spot you for, uh, for discussion and questions. Uh, and when you do so, obviously turn your mic on so uh, others can hear you in the room and remotely. For those of you remote, uh, keep your video on uh, and also use the hand raise function. Uh, and if anybody needs help, uh, let us know and we'll try to assist you. So with that logistics backdrop, uh, uh, let's jump into uh, the agenda. Uh, I'll just offer some opening remarks uh, and then uh, uh, hand the floor over to Ponch in a moment for some remarks as well. Uh, there's a, a full agenda, no surprise, there always is. Uh, we're going to kick off with something fun. Um, we're going to hear from our three board members who were on the ice uh, just before the holidays, the first time since uh, 2019. Um, so the first visit of board members since post-COVID. Uh, and uh, then we'll follow with some tributes to some folks who've been uh, influential in our community. Uh, over this day and this session, we'll uh, talk with NSF uh, on a variety of subjects, including NSF's role in AI. Um, um, some diversity and inclusion activities uh, and NSF efforts around creating a safer research environment in Antarctica and, of course, more broadly across the SE uh, community. Uh, the open meetings today will include reports from the NSB committees on external engagement and the National Science and Engineering Policy, as well as two working groups on talent development uh, and national security. We'll end the day with a closed meeting of the Committee on Strategy, uh, where we'll get an update on the NSF's FY24 budget and a preview and discussion of the FY25 budget. Um, a few other things to note, uh, the NSB NSF Commission on Merit Review, affectionately known as MRX, uh, is soliciting input from uh, all of the s &E community is part of um, a decadal uh, re-examination of merit review. And I don't mean the review will take a decade. I mean, it's been a decade <laughs> since uh, uh, it has been examined. And obviously the world is quite a bit different uh, than it was uh, a decade ago. So uh, welcome input uh, across uh, NSF, uh, those with uh, implementation responsibilities. Uh, and we've asked people uh, to participate in a voluntary survey, our data contractor, Mathematica, is soliciting input. Uh, I'll be sending out another reminder, uh, people, uh, for an opportunity to participate in that. So if you haven't, I encourage you to uh, make sure your voice is heard. Uh, I want to offer a congratulation to Dario Gill, who uh, is not here today, and, and to our fearless leader, Ponch, for being elected to the National Academy of Engineering recently. <laughs> Um, and uh, I will give you a brief ap uh, update on some of the things I've been doing uh, since uh, since we last met. Um, late last year, Vic and I uh, met with a whole variety of folks in Congress. We met with uh, all of the co-sponsors of the Create AI Act uh, to talk about AI, about uh, uh, NARE, the National AI Research Research, um, and about the importance of supporting that. I'll note yesterday, the House named a bipartisan committee uh, for uh, AI, uh, and uh, one of the members that we met with, Representative Obernolte, uh, is the uh, majority chair, uh, and Representative Liu is the minority chair. So had good conversations with Representative Obernolte about uh, uh, AI issues, uh, uh, and uh, uh, a person with some like-minded uh, technical background. He's a Caltech grad and also has an AI degree. So that was a fun conversation uh, to geek out with him. Uh, Vic was able to join me with most of those meetings. Uh, we also met uh, with the House uh, Science Committee uh, to discuss some of the progress in Antarctica. Um, and uh, 
Dario and I and the NSBO staff and Vic when he can have been continuing to talk with uh, the co-chairs of the Science Technology Action Committee. You'll remember at our previous meeting, they came and briefed us on their report. Uh, we're continuing to talk about collaborative action with them um, as how we raise the, uh, the awareness of the importance of investment in science and technology in our workforce development. Yesterday, um, I met with the, uh, the Senate Commerce Science and uh, uh, Transportation Committee along with Vic. Uh, we had a really great conversation around uh, uh, a whole panoply of topics from AI to workforce development to uh, diversity and inclusion activities and the importance of uh, uh, the TIP directorate and the regional innovation engines uh, as we broaden access uh, to research and technology transfer. Uh, and then uh, uh, yesterday afternoon, um, Vic and I met with the APOU Council on Research uh, and talked about a bunch of those same issues uh, as we uh, we look to uh, to the future. Um, I just uh, noted uh, at our last meeting, uh, we thanked uh, uh, Kathy Jackert for her service, and she's gone off to the Peace Corps as as we remarked before. Uh, but I want to say a big thank you in the interim as John's looking for her replacement to Demonica, to Jasmine, and the others who stepped up really to, to pick up her role. So thank you to all of you for, uh, for those activities. Um, and at this point, uh, we're going to transition to um, the, the conversation around the experience in Antarctica. Um, Beverly, uh, Aaron, and Kayvon uh, were on the ice uh, in December. Uh, and we've asked them if they would share some highlights from their trip. All of us who've been to the ice know it is a, uh, an extraordinary experience. Uh, they had an opportunity both to tour the facilities, but also exercise the board's uh, role in its oversight uh, to interview people and gain insights from um, the working environment uh, um, at McMurdo uh, and at the pole. Um, and so, with that, I'm going to turn the floor over to Aaron uh, to start uh, that presentation and let him hand it off to Beverly and, uh, and Kayvon. <laughs> All right, we've got some video going there. Yeah, so I, it was just an incredible experience. It was, um, it was unexpectedly moving for me to go there. Um, and <clears throat> what, what I finally realized, what it felt like, and having never been an astronaut, it must be what how astronauts feel when they are looking upon the Earth from above, from a completely different perspective. And seeing us, seeing our planet, seeing humanity, and what we're able to achieve, and how um, uh, how precious it is this planet that we live on, um, and how and how exposed and hostile it is when when we're in a place like that, looking down upon our home. That's how, to me, it felt to be there in Antarctica. Um, and I know that Kayvon <clears throat> shared similar experiences, and I even have a video of him talking about it feeling like we landed on Mars. Mm -hmm. And that's, that's these dry valleys here that we're seeing in this video is, um, is in fact what it felt like. So it was a very moving experience, and that everybody there is committed to this idea um, and it's and it's not just scientists. It's not just professors and grad students and postdocs. It's people who make pizzas, people who clean the the bathrooms, people who wash the linens, um, the carpenters, the electricians, the firefighters, the the guys who and gals who fuel that helicopter there. Um, <clears throat> it's an entire town. It's an entire cult, a culture, uh, a village, and uh, and people. They, uh, they work where they live. So it, it's like a medieval village in a sense. Like you're stuck there and those are, those are, our, those are your people. Um, and they welcomed us like guests. I mean, like kings really. To be a VIP there is really somewhat embarrassing because you get to do all of the coolest things that um, most of those people never do. And they're there because they know that those kinds of things are going on in Antarctica. So it's just a huge privilege for us to be there uh, as VIPs. But I'm glad that we also um, had a, a large fraction of our time devoted to just talking and listening to people. And that for me was really the, I wanted to make sure that was the reason I, that we were going, that I was going, was to be able to 
to listen in a town hall. And that's pretty much what we did. We didn't, we didn't uh, sermonize or talk. We just listened for the most part. We had a, um, we had a large uh, gathering of uh, 100 or 200 people in the, in the refectory there in the cafeteria in McMurdo Station. Then we had a bunch of one-on-one -on -one meetings with people. Um, we went to the Pulse Station and talked to the scientists there. And so it was a listening session for us uh, as board members to see what, what's really going on down there, what's the lived life like down there, because I can tell you that um, you can read or watch as many movies as you want, um, but you, it's hard to really know what it really means until you go down there. And so I want to thank uh, the science board for sending us there and to just emphasize how important the work is that's being done there by all of those people. Um, and so just a great privilege. So we owe them, I think, um, a tremendous amount of thanks and respect and, a, and a, we have a sacred duty to make sure that the work that's being done down there is uh, it's a safe environment where people can thrive and they can and they can do this thing that um, is a once in a lifetime opportunity even to just go and be a carpenter there uh, on the ice. So um, I think that's our job here in the National Science Board to make sure that happens. Well said, Heron. Thank you so much. Um, one of the one of the other activities that I'm involved in is um, I I'm a member of the National Academy of Space Studies Board, and one of the one of the things that we're actively talking about with NASA is the the science drivers for the NASA Artemis program. As in, you know, there's important and unique science that can be done on the surface of the Moon, and so what do you need to do? to get there, to get people there, to get the equipment there that you need to do that science. And it, occurred, <coughs> it occurs to me that this is the closest thing to that that NSF does. Um, you know, we, we, we got to learn about the, the science experiments that are happening at the pole, talk to the, the scientists and the students who are getting that experience, you know, developing the next generation of scientific leadership uh, through those experiences and to see firsthand what a heavy lift, as it were, <laughs> it takes to make that science possible. Um, it, it, was, it was important to see it firsthand. Um, but also to Aaron's point about, you know, these are, you know, at the end of the day, <coughs> science and discovery is, is done by people. And the people there, um, you, you, you really got a sense of how excited they are about the mission, the scientific mission. Uh, we met um, two uh, young women on a um, helicopter refueling outpost. <laughs> um, and they understood that what they were doing was to further and to advance the scientific mission, and they were excited to be a part of it. Um, we, um, in our discussions, I think we, you know, we uncovered some uh, uh, important uh, challenges and issues that, you know, that we've discussed uh, with with um, NSF leadership around um, you know, some uh, management issues, you know, ensuring you know, that logistics are what they need to be to ensure that people are able to bring their full selves to this work that they're so committed to, um, and and the the upcoming. Um, contracting process will be very important, but um, what an experience and um, what important work we're doing there and how important it is to make sure that everything that it takes to make that work possible um, you know, uh, it, it, it is good and it is what it needs to be. I was just enthralled with the video I was watching. Um, there's really very little I can add to this. This was this was one of the things that struck me was when I got there and I talked to people, one of the first things they'd say was, is this your first time on the ice? And that's when I realized that a lot of the people that I was talking to viewed this as a as a workplace that they had been to for many, many, many years. And it was just a normal place to work. Um, for them, so it was it was a pretty remarkable trip. I think um, I do want to mention that the the Air New Zealand, the Royal Royal Air New Zealand people who did the transporting of us to McMurdo, they were amazing. 
um, really very highly competent and just really friendly and um, just nice folks. Everybody on base, everybody that we talked to was incredibly welcoming. They were incredibly open with um, their thoughts about the work they did, the importance of the work they did, um, the issues that they were facing. Uh, and all, all said with this air of, we know it will get better. We know that things can improve and we want to be part of that. Um, so that was, that was really very exciting to me, um, to really be in that kind of environment with people who all really had a very common, um, perception about their, their workplace, which, um, I won't say inhospitable <laughs> environment, but it was cold and the sun never went down. And then you see stuff like this that, that reminded me of like kind of Mad Max, like apocalyptic kinds of scenery um, that were just totally unique and totally amazing. Um, they really, in it, it still, I, I, when people ask how long were you there and I have to think about it, we got there we were a day late. We got there on Tuesday evening and we left on Friday morning. And I feel like I spent a year and a half there, just not from a bad perspective, but so we were going, going, going from seven in the morning until, and I'd say at night, but as I said, the sun never went down. So you're just staying up. Um, I really want to thank um, Linnea and Alex, our, our trusty tour guides for the visit. They were fabulous. They, they had so much knowledge about um, the area and, and I don't think they ever said our questions were stupid. So that was really nice. Um, but again, I think that, that we, the U.S. presence in Antarctica, I think is important. And I think that we are, um, we are obligated to do it right and do it well for the people that live there, for the people that research there and for the outcomes that they hope to achieve by doing their research there. So I do want to thank the board for allowing me to represent you on this trip. Um, somebody asked me if I was scared. Oh, yeah. <laughs> I was not. It was a long flight over a lot of water, and there were no gas stations. And it just, but it was, it was worth it. It was well worth it. If I might, I'll maybe end with just a humorous anecdote. So in addition to the three of us uh, representing the National Science Board, we were also accompanied by uh, the U.S. ambassador to, uh, to New Zealand. And, um, you know, when we're on these various flights, right, we're flying on these military cargo planes and we're literally sitting in the cargo hold, right? And so we, we, you're privy to what the, the, the flight crew are, are saying to one another. And... Um, on each of the flights that we were on, um, as we were approaching our destination, I, could, I, I would hear one of the flight crew basically um, communicating to the, to the destination, sort of what the, essentially what was, on, what was on board, what the cargo was. <laughs> and I noticed a pattern. Uh, they would say on one flight, they'd say, uh, we have 18 pallets and four DVs. And then another flight, they'd say, we have 22 pallets, um, and, a, and, a, and a tractor <laughs> and four DVs. <laughs> and I finally realized four DVs was the four of us, distinguished visitors. Uh, and so on the one hand, we were included in the cargo, <laughs> uh, um, but we were special cargo. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Any, any other comments, uh, Beverly or Aaron? It is an extraordinary experience. All of us have been there. Um, and it is an impressive uh, operation uh, to conduct amazing research in, uh, as Kaylin said, a truly extraordinarily in, uh, difficult environment. And so uh, kudos to the people who uh, support the operation as well as the research that's done there. Um, let me turn to a couple other things and then uh, thank you all three for that uh, 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 summary of your experiences. February is, is Black History Month. Uh, it's an opportunity to celebrate uh, contributions from black scientists and engineers, including 
uh, to acknowledge our own board members, um, uh, Merlin Theodore, uh, Wanda Ward, Beverly Watford, uh, and of course, Vice Chair Victor McCrary. It's also uh, in a uh, challenging time, an opportunity to uh, reaffirm uh, in the science board's commitment to the historically marginalized missing millions uh, in STEM um, and our 2020 commitment uh, statement on racism and science technology uh, and uh, continued progress to remove barriers uh, and ensure that the s and &E environment is one where everyone is respected, included, and has opportunity. We've also highlighted uh, the unique legacy and important role of our uh, historically black colleges and universities, or HBCUs, uh, as a critical part of the science and engineering ecosystem, and also as a national security asset for the STEM talent that our country needs. Uh, in a moment, I'm going to turn the floor over to Ponch, who's going to pay tribute to uh, uh, the late Congresswoman uh, Eddie Bernice Johnson, uh, known as EBJ, to everyone uh, in the business. Uh, but I also want to acknowledge the contributions of former NSF Director John Slaughter, who, who passed away recently. Uh, he was a pioneer as the very first uh, black director of NSF. He was the third black inductee into the National Academy of Engineering, uh, and he was the first black <coughs> chancellor at, at the University of Maryland. Uh, while at NSF, he pushed for broadening the talent pool, uh, which is a critical part now of Vision 2030 and the missing millions. Uh, and he received a wide variety of, of well-earned and justified honors uh, uh, over the years. So, as I said, EBJ uh, uh, chaired uh, the House Science Committee and was a tireless champion for diversity and inclusion, but also investment in science and engineering. And uh, all of us who knew her and had an opportunity to interact with her can only uh, express our sadness as is true with uh, uh, late President Slaughter. Uh, the world is the less for their departure, uh, but it is the better for the contributions they made to our country uh, and to our world. And so it's important that we remember uh, and be grateful for those who made those commitments and sacrifices uh, to position us where we are, uh, even in a world of, of change. Uh, and let's not forget for that. And so with that, I'm going to hand the floor over to Ponch uh, for his remarks and also his comments uh, on both of those in remembrance. Ponch. Thank you very much, Dan. Um, pardon my cold. That's what happens when you have grandchildren. <clears throat> They give a lot of gifts, including coals and other things. Um, so uh, bear with my voice that way. Um, as always, I'm very delighted to be sharing with you some of NSF's incredible accomplishments today. But before I go any further, I wanted to say thank you to the board members who went onto the ice. It was a great reflection. It reminded me of my own 2015 journey onto the ice. It was indeed a very special moment. It made it even more special for me, something that I would share personally. My dad, a radio astronomer, um, I talked to him um, FaceTime from there to India, and he was just so excited. And I'm so glad because that's such a memory for me because he passed a few months later. And uh, that was such an uh, indelible impression that I had of that trip, which is my dad uh, you know, joining me in celebrating my presence on the ice and what he has heard about you know, the radio astronomy tele telescopes that were there, there which he had used. <clears throat> Um, what, before I get into the details of the NSF uh, uh, and accomplishments and so on, I want to take uh, the moment uh, to echo Dan's remarks uh, by celebrating and honoring extraordinary individuals of the past, present, and the future that we are creating during the Black History Month. And I'm so, as, as Dan said, uh, I'm grateful to my colleagues here, Wanda Ward, uh, you know, Marilyn, uh, Theodore, Beverly Watford, and the fearless vice chair, Rick McCrary, as a colleague and now as vice chair. Thank you for all your contributions, all of you. You make NSF a much better place because of your work. Thank you. Um, it's very clear that the contributions and achievements that have been made by Black Americans to science and engineering continue to have a lasting impact on all our lives. You all know one of the most successful models for increasing the participation of underrepresented minorities and underrepresented groups is the minority serving institutions, very specifically, historically black colleges and universities. And at NSF, 
we have a long history of recognizing and supporting the importance of HPCUs, and it's only going to intensify more if you've already seen the trajectory in the last few years. One of our earliest efforts to broaden participation in science was the launch of the HPCU program in 1972. Since then, this program has dramatically expanded, spurring new programs and approaches to enhance the quality of STEM education and research at our nation's institutions and diversifying the nation's STEM workforce. But I want to be very clear that scientific innovation is driven by individuals. And I would like to take a moment to recognize the lasting impact two inspirational individuals left on the scientific and technological enterprise who left us this December. Former NSF director, Dr. John Brooks Slaughter. I've had the chance to uh, talk to him, a phenomenal individual, phenomenal individual. And of course, I've had the chance to interact and the privilege and the honor to interact with US representative and chairwoman, an amazing science leader for our nation, the honorable Eddie Bernice Johnson. And you know what they have done for the advancement of science and advancement of NSF clearly is phenomenal and have left a very lasting impact on the agency and science. I think I went a little bit earlier, yeah. Um, Dr. Slaughter, as, as Dan uh, nicely noted, the first black director of NSF, spent his distinguished career championing diversity in science and engineering, working tirelessly to advance the agency's role in science, education, and social sciences. He understood the importance of engineering as its own field and was a leader in establishing the engineering directorate. He was the leader who established the engineering directorate. He fought for the full inclusion of women and minorities. He received the inaugural US Black Engineer of the Year Award in 1987 and was honored at the White House with the Presidential Award for Excellence in Science, Mathematics, and Engineering Mentoring in 2015. He truly expanded the frontiers of NSF's work in many ways, and his legacy continues to be felt in how NSF carries out its mission today. As I said, we also lost an amazing champion in Chairwoman Eddie Bernice Johnson, who was a US representative and the first black woman to chair the House Committee on Science, Space, and Technology. She was not only a public servant, but a trailblazer who left profound impacts across STEM, healthcare, and social justice. I had the opportunity and the honor of writing to her son, expressing my sentiments about her and her contributions. So much so that our NSF Includes Initiative, which is a national initiative designed to enhance US leadership in discoveries and innovation by focusing on diversity, inclusion, and broadening participation in STEM, was renamed, and we were there together, Vic and I, on this amazing celebration. And it's important to celebrate, you know, when they are there, to experience that and, uh, and to honor them. And so we were fortunate enough to do that. And we have renamed the NSF includes as the NSF Eddie Bernice Johnson includes initiative. And she was so proud of that. The renaming of this flagship program is a tribute to our unwavering dedication to ensuring that everyone has the opportunity to participate in our nation's STEM enterprise. I want to take a moment of silence to honor the great legacies of Dr. Slaughter and former chairwoman, Eddie Bernice Johnson. To the two great leaders, I say thank you, thank you, thank you. But I would be remiss if I did not acknowledge the amazing leaders at NSF who contribute every day, and amazing staff of NSF who contribute every day. NSF would not be the place without their phenomenal contributions. The black scientists, engineers, the black staff members, it's just an amazing contribution. I see it every day, I experience it every day. I want to take a moment to express my gratitude to all of them. NSF would not be the same without all of your work and contributions. Thank you. 
as I always anchor my presentations. You know, I just want to make sure the context is never where you're wondering where we are. So to anchor the presentations, we have the three pillars, as you know, strengthening established NSF, the strategic priorities, inspiring missing millions, and accelerating technology and innovation. Let me give you some quick, as I always do, vignettes of progress in this area so that you can see firsthand the great work that is being done on strengthening established NSF. Since I was young, I've been passionate about finding solutions to global challenges from things like poverty to climate change and sustainable development. And as I got older, I kind of learned that the scientific advancement is a great tool for understanding and even sometimes solving some of these real world problems. I'm excited to help design and deploy the world's first battery free and fully autonomous micro robots. My hope for these types of devices is that they can aid in search and rescue missions, gas leak detection, wireless networking, 3D mapping if you have them as swarms, animal tracking, environmental monitoring, and pretty much any other type of exciting application. The NSF has funded my research for three years now um, through their GRFP fellowship. That was funding that I put towards this Millimobile project and being able to say to my advisor, like, look, I have this proposal that the NSF approved for working on these tiny battery-free devices. And so that's what I'm going to do. And so this idea of moving towards these smaller autonomous devices is inspecting a warehouse, making sure that there's something there, doing a little uh, a check for, for gas, you know, in a dangerous environment where you don't have to send a person or a big robot, you can send some of these small autonomous devices that are battery free and uh, end up generating less waste. There's a lot of insights that science provides in order to kind of take on some of the like biggest shared challenges that we have in the world. And I think research and discovery can help uncover solutions that will redefine the global problem space that we have a decade from now. As you can see, NSF's mission is simple and enduring. We make strategic investments in researchers, infrastructure, and programs that expand the frontiers of discovery and innovation. And that includes the new talent that we inspire every day. And you saw an example of such a talent in this, in this video, and it's always exciting to see that. These talent bring in new ideas and invigorate innovation all across the nation. So in addition to talent and ideas and partnerships, you know, we, I mean, the, the, the concept of addition talent, the ideas and partnerships, you know, essentially make possible amazing discoveries, amazing innovations, amazing impact. And uh, this is something that we celebrate even the last time, the number of Nobel laureates that had the NSF funding early in their career. Um, now to something that celebrates the activities of NSF that is again uh, done by the individuals. So as you know, Moore's law, is the observation that number of transistors in an integrated circuit doubles roughly every two years. However, this trend stagnated almost a decade ago. But NSF investments are enabling new ways of approaching semiconductor design at a critical moment of this industry. At Penn State, a team of researchers are pioneering the development of 3D semiconductor technology built from 2D materials. Their innovation has the potential to miniaturize chip sizes while simultaneously enhancing computer power and efficiency, setting the stage for chips that are not only faster and smaller, but also equipped with new capabilities such as advanced sensors, memory, and improved battery management. This breakthrough was enabled by NSF's Materials Innovation Platform, or MIP, a mid-scale infrastructure program designed to fast-track progress in materials research. You all participate in the mid-scale infrastructure program, some of the uh, proposals that we ultimately decide to fund. MIP is fostering a culture of team-based, highly integrated activities, research, education, and training with a focus on developing and providing access to next-generation tools and data in response to the materials genome initiative that will enable the development of new materials. The new vistas of Materials Genome Initiative is truly exciting. MIP is also building collaborative networks where communities of researchers and scientists are sharing resources and knowledge to significantly speed up the journey of materials discovery and applications. Again, this is just one example. I'm taking exemplars to keep exciting all of you that your work that you're doing 
is actually having a huge impact in all the things that happens every day across our nation. So this is one, one example of NSF investments, how they open door to innovation that will power our nation's prosperity and success. And talking about partnerships, how we do that with partnerships. This is an excellent example of how we do that with partnerships. There are many, many, many partnerships that we have embarked on at NSF. So last year, if you recall, you heard from Simon Malcomber from the Bio Directorate and how NSF and the Paul G. Allen Family Foundation, they're partnering to develop and implement action plans that advance biodiversity conservation. I'm pleased to give you an update on the work on how this partnership is helping research investments contribute to new approaches and how we protect the environment. So the partnership to advance conservation science and practice, PACSP, was launched with 8 million co-investment to support six pioneering projects. These projects are geared towards developing science-based conservation plans and tools via academic conservation organization partnerships. One of those projects is led by the San Diego Zoo Wildlife Alliance with Iowa State University to enhance deserts, tortoises, resilience to the challenges posed by climate change. The goal of this project is to harness the power of models to predict when and where species may experience conditions that threaten their survival. The insights that come from this work will help researchers fine tune their conservation strategies, helping safeguard species and preserve the ecosystems they inhabit. The success of the partnership to advance conservation science and practice has not only yielded, yielded tangible results in the field, but it has yielded additional investments from both NSF and the Paul G. Allen Family Foundation, as well as sparked new avenues for collaboration. NSF, in fact, has joined forces with the Kavli Foundation to embark on another ambitious initiative, the Neurobiology in Changing Ecosystems, or NICE, opportunity aims to inform to, or predict resilience through the lens of neural mechanisms, organisms, or environments, marking a step forward in our understanding of the intricate connections between neurobiology and ecosystem of health. So just a few exemplars on the first theme, strengthening established NSF. Now to inspiring missing millions. As we all know, to truly transform the world through innovation, we need to make sure that every single person in every single community across our nation has access to opportunities. We must continue to strengthen pathways into STEM and expand our reach into all communities because talent exists everywhere. So the GEO directorate, I like to profile different directorates in their work through this presentation, the GEO broadening participation overview that I want to share with you. So the Directorate of Geosciences is working to meet the demands of a future where a transdisciplinary geoscience workforce reflects the nation's true diversity. One leader in this field, who I'm sure we will continue to see great things from, is Dr. Anita Marshall from the University of Florida. Let's take a look at what she's doing. People have a very narrow view of what disability looks like and what it entails. A lot of times they immediately picture a wheelchair user or somebody with a guide dog, and those are absolutely disabilities, but they are a small minority of disabilities. I realized early on that we really could not call ourselves a truly inclusive field course if we did not have an option for virtual participation. So we're about to start the live stream. Everybody buckle up, let's get to it. Unlike a lot of virtual options, we didn't want something canned. It was absolutely imperative that they be a integral part of the field course and what we did on a daily, even hourly basis. Maybe part of the problems we have recruiting and retaining diverse identities in the geosciences has something to do with how we run our field courses and how we run our experiential learning programs. Most field courses are extremely inaccessible in just about every way. Everything from the food selection, to the lodging, to the activities in the field, everything is inaccessible. 
The problem is that for many geoscience programs, you cannot graduate without a field experience. So when we exclude students with disabilities from field experiences, we are excluding them from our profession. I, I hope it sparks some conversations, and beyond conversations, I hope it sparks action, that people really take a hard look at their own field courses and maybe what they could do differently. The Directorate of Geosciences is a shining example of how NSF is taking multiple approaches on multiple levels to invest in a broad research ecosystem where NSF investments are accelerating societal benefits. So you saw that Dr. Marshall's research and outreach is one of the many ways NSF is supporting individuals through programs like Geopaths, which aims to increase the number of students pursuing undergraduate and postgraduate degrees through engagement in authentic, career-relevant experiences. The other programs focused on empowering individuals include the Faculty Development in Geo Space Science, FTSS program, which is working to increase diversity by creating tenure-track positions and developing programs at institutions like Montana State University, West Virginia University, Georgia State University, and the University of Hawaii. changing culture through capacity building. Now, initiatives such as cultural transformation in the geoscience community and geo opportunities for leadership and diversity, we call it golden, are reshaping the culture within geosciences towards inclusivity, equity, and accessibility. These programs are preparing a new generation of leaders via projects that are based on education scholarship, mentorship, anti-racist, and anti-harassment practices. Likewise, programs like P for Climate, P for Climate and Geo Embrace focus on expanding the reach to emerging institutions, enhancing research capacity and building a more inclusive geoscience community. P for Climate supports researchers and students with diverse experiences and backgrounds in research that have been underrepresented in paleoclimatology and geosciences. The relatively new Geo Embrace program was designed based on the feedback from the people in the community that NSF is trying to reach, individuals and institutions from that have historically not engaged with NSF. So Geo Embrace is developing support systems and resources to help faculty members in geosciences and related fields at non-R1 institutions in submitting and obtaining federal investments. The type of work that Geo is doing through these programs reflects critical efforts that are happening across every other directorate and every part of the agency. I want to underscore that point, that this is not unique to GEO. We are trying to transcend beyond the traditional way of looking at programs to programs that clearly reach in and build this concept of inclusivity and ensuring that talent is, you know, uh, has the opportunities everywhere. So broadening participation, which we talk about quite a bit, is essential to the future success of the research community, and this will continue to be NSF's top priority. And as you know, the program that has you know, really worked on this in an intentional way with intensity is our granted program. And I'm pleased to say, coming at the top of this hour, after reporting here, NSF is set to announce $20 million of investment across eight institutions through the granted initiative, which is set to have a transformative impact for emerging research and minority serving institutions play in the NSF proposal and award opportunities. This investment emphasizes the agency's dedication to empowering institutions, fostering inclusivity, and propelling the entire research ecosystem towards greater heights of excellence. I'm truly excited for everyone to learn about the eight projects breaking down barriers to research access. This is something that we just launched when I came and I felt that this is very important for institutions to have the resources in terms of the infrastructure that allows the talent everywhere to be able to you know, make the best of the opportunities that are available, that is available to NSF, at NSF. The third pillar, accelerating technology and innovation. NSF is continuing to make investments in remarkable use-inspired innovations and technologies that will no doubt change the world. You all participated in this and thanks to all your efforts, all your efforts, Last month marked a historic moment for NSF with the announcement 
of the first ever NSF Engines Awards, a transformative initiative for our agency and for our nation. The inaugural NSF Engines investments comprise of 10 teams spanning 18 states and carries the potential of 1.6 billion investment over the coming decade. This is in addition to the Type 1 awards, 44 of them which were announced, and we are still working on the others to be able to leverage the ones in Type 2 to still be invested in through Type 1s. And this will span every part of our nation and ensure that innovation in place is inspired, motivated, energized. The announcement delivers on the bipartisan priorities outlined in the Chips and Science Act of 2022, which authorized the NSF's engines program. And with all your help, this represents one of the single largest broad investment in place-based research and development in the nation's history. NSF's initial 150 million investment in these 10 regions is being matched nearly two to one in commitments. And this I want to underscore this. While NSF is investing 150 million, we have gotten 350 million in matching investments to make this a half a billion dollar scale program. That's important for sustainability and the long-term you know, impact of these investments. So these commitments come from state and local governments, other federal agencies, philanthropy, and private industry. This is consistent with how we have talked about this program. The goals are ambitious, yet very clear, to catalyze and accelerate R&D-based innovation ecosystems that advance the technology's key to US competitiveness, address nation, societal, and geostrategic challenges, promote economic growth, enable job creation, and cultivate regional talent. I'm incredibly proud of the work that has gone into making the NSF engines a success. This program is going to be the foundation for economic growth, job growth, and prosperity in communities across the country. And I want to take a moment to thank the amazing TIP directorate and the rest of the agency all came together. All came to all the offices, TIP, and others came together to do this in a rapid time scale and to all your help in getting this processed. So this is a moment for us to jointly celebrate the success. Yes, sir. Just want to yes, sir. interrupt just very briefly. Want to also call out for you and also, but also Erwin and his yes. team gave a great talk last night to the Council on Research of all the VPRs from the big schools, talked about TIP, stood up to a lot of the good questions, uh, very good, explained it very well. I think people walked away that this is one of the strong successes of NSF, and obviously now you have a lot more people in terms of foot soldiers being willing to go up to the hill and to their communities talking about this program. So again, kudos to you, Erwin, and your team. Thank you, Thank you very, very much. much, Rick. Thank you. Thank you for saying that. Really appreciate that. And thanks for all your help. And you and Dan, you know, going walking the hills, uh, corridor, as you said, all the work that you're doing, you know, it takes a village. <laughs> the entire 24 members of the board and myself, you know, uh, pounding the pavement and making sure that this is a success. I appreciate that. Um, I, had the, I had the good fortune. I have some stories to tell you on this one, and we'll reserve it for uh, lunch if you really are interested in this. My visit with um, First Lady Jill Biden, Dr. Jill Biden, to the Forsyth Technical Community College to launch the inaugural NSF Regional Innovation Engines. I truly had the honor of traveling down to North Carolina with First Lady Dr. Biden to announce two of the NSF engines at the Forsyth Technical Community College. Dr. Biden, who spoke about President Biden's investing in America agenda, and how community colleges continue to play a critical role in fostering the next generation of STEM workers. The governor, uh, Roy Cooper, was there, and, and the mayor was there, and uh, I celebrated the bipartisan support, strong support in Congress for this amazing in initiative that we have been able to launch. The first two engines, the Piedmont Triad, Triad Regenerative Medicine Engine and North Carolina Sustainable Textiles Innovation Engine are both anchored in North Carolina and will each receive 15 million for two years and up to 160 million over 10 years. The Piedmont Triad Regenerative Medicine Engine, folks, this had 82 partners. The 10 engines have 477 partners. That's how we want to do this. It is, you know, it's a community coming together. The Piedmont Triad Regenerative Medicine Engine will tap the world's largest regenerative medicine cluster to create and scale breakthrough clinical therapies, contributing to an ever-growing industry that is key to healthcare delivery. The engine led by the Wake Forest University School of Medicine will spearhead a coalition of H2 partners serving the Piedmont Triad region in North Carolina to advance the key technology area of biotechnology. The North Carolina Sustainable Textiles Innovation Engine spanning parts of North Carolina, South Carolina, Tennessee, yes, Tennessee, and Virginia will revolutionize the 90 billion textile industry 
by fostering innovations in sustainable fabrics, improving the capacity for environmentally sustainable textiles, reducing waste, increasing efficiency, and reducing carbon outputs. The engine, led by nonprofit, the Industrial Commons, guiding a coalition of 44 partners serving the Western North Carolina and parts of South Carolina, Tennessee, and Virginia to promote advancement in key technology areas of advancing manufacturing and material science. Several, you're hearing about this, in fact, two days ago, uh, Urban was uh, in Colorado launching that engine uh, with, the, with uh, Senator Hickenlooper. Several of the NSF engines have marked their official launches with public events, showcasing their innovative and collaborative efforts aimed at driving technological and scientific advancements across the nation. We had the Colorado-Wyoming Climate Resilience Engine, other upcoming launches, North Carolina Sustainable Textiles Innovation Engine, and the Louisiana Energy Transition Engines by the governor of Louisiana, and with more to come. All 10 NSF engines hold significant promise to elevate and transform entire geographical regions into world-leading world -leading, um, regions of innovation. On February 10th, on February 10th, we celebrated a momentous occasion with the singing, with, I'm sorry, with the signing and singing of the National Semiconductor Technology Center Consortium. Well, it may be worth singing yeah, about too. That's it. <laughs> <laughs> that's, that, that, I hope so, um, for the same page. <laughs> um, I had the honor of joining the leaders from the White House, Dr. Prabhakar, Department of Commerce, Secretary Romando, Department of Energy, Secretary Granholm, and the uh, Secretary of Defense, Sec Deputy Secretary Hicks, as well as the NCAST, the National Center for Advancement of Semiconductor Technology, new incoming director, Deirdre Hanford, at the White House to announce an over $5 billion investment, $5 billion investment in the Chips and Science Act of 2022 research and development programs, including the National Semiconductor Technology Centers. NSF is a strong partner, and they are looking to NSF's workforce programs as a way of ensuring that we're developing the talent for the future. The NSTC is bringing together public and private partners to accelerate groundbreaking innovations in semiconductor technology. By joining forces with the federal agencies, this is another example of partnerships and public-private partners, we can ensure that the nation remains at the forefront of not only semiconductor technology on the global stage, but that it becomes an exemplar for all the other technologies that we want to be you know, in the vanguard of competitiveness. Okay, as always, in your board book, Amanda Greenwell has provided you with an information item on legislative and public affairs activities since the August board meeting. As always, OLPA has kept us very connected to Congress, to the administration, our scientific community, and the public. I noted some of those in my remarks you know, earlier, and if anyone have any questions with OLPA or the report, um, please feel free to chime in. If not, I will jump to the next last few minutes that I have on the senior executive updates. I'm going to use every minute of my time, <laughs> Mr. <laughs> Mr. Chair. <laughs> He's looking and saying, can we get a few extra moments for coffee? <laughs> so on senior executive introdu introductions, as I always do, as has become our tradition, I would like to introduce to our newest cohort of senior executives. The individuals I'm going to introduce are critical components of the leadership of NSF. And I'm very proud of being with them. I mean, these are amazing leaders I'm very fortunate to work with every day. And their expertise will play an important role in carrying out the strategic mission of the agency. First up, Dr. Saul Gonzalez. Saul, if you'll come up here so people can see you. You'll all come up here, people can see you. Saul be began his SES career appointment as Division Director, Division of Physics in Directorate of Mathematical and Physical Sciences, MPS. Hey, Saul. He previously served as Senior Science Advisor for Strategy and Engagement in MPS. Dr. Gonzalez received his PhD in physics from the Massachusetts Institute of Technology. Thank you, Saul. Really appreciate you. <laughs> Dr. Charles Cunningham. Charles, please come up, sir. Began serving as SES career appointment as Deputy Division Director, Division of Molecular and Cellular Biosciences, MCB, in the Directorate of Biological Sciences. Prior to this role, he has served as both the Deputy Division Director and Program Officer in Bio. Dr. Cunningham received his PhD in Immunology from the University of Aberdeen, Scotland, UK. Charles, thank you so much for your service. <laughs> Dr. Kemi La DG Ozias. As I always say, Kemi, you can mispronounce my name and I will not hold you to it. <laughs> Began serving as her, her SES career appointment as Deputy Division Director, 
Division of Engineering Education and Centers in the Directorate of Engineering. She previously served as Associate Dean for Undergraduate Studies at Morgan State University and as an NSF Program Officer. Dr. Lajeji Ozias received her PhD in Biomedical Engineering from Rutgers University and the University of Medicine and Dentistry of New Jersey. Kemi, thank you so much for your service. <laughs> Mr. Jesse Simmons began serving his SES career appointment as Deputy Division Director, Division of Financial Management in the Office of Budget, Finance, and Award Management. He previously served as Payments and Analytics Branch Chiefs in BFA. Mr. Simons received his MBA from the University of Maryland College Park. I can tell you, Jesse, you know, uh, we are very thrilled to have you here, and we know already the impact that you're making, so great to have you join us and our team. And uh, thank you. <laughs> Dr. Junping Wang began, ser began serving as the SES career appointment as Division Director, Division of Mathematical Sciences in the Directorate of Mathematical and Physical Sciences. He previously served as a program officer in a limited term SES appointment. Dr. Wang received his PhD in mathematics from the University of Chicago. Junping, thank you so much for your service. Really appreciate that. <laughs> Mr. Chair and members of the board, we would not be able to do all of this without the great support, your help, your counsel, and your partnership. Thank you so much. And I yield the floor to you with two minutes to spare, Mr. Chair. <laughs> Thank you, Paj, for that always rousing introduction uh, and summary of activities at, at NSF. Um, we're going to turn to an obscure topic I doubt any of you have ever heard anything about before, uh, artificial intelligence. It's rarely been in the news, and it's not been much of a topic of conversation. I jest, of course. <laughs> Uh, it, uh, it is everywhere, uh, and there were deep and profound issues uh, around it, both in terms of the R&D enterprise, but its uh, potential implications for society and culture, for economic competitiveness, uh, and for national security. Um, and what we're going to hear today is uh, a description of NSS role uh, and uh, its engagement across AI. Uh, we've got a couple of folks who are coming up, uh, Tess and Michael, who will speak to uh, NSF's activities uh, uh, and role in the future of AI uh, and talk uh, about some of the uh, successes and opportunities, but also uh, some of the, the challenges. Uh, I'll just uh, opine as they're setting up that, as you know, the NAIR pilot is launched. One of the great challenges uh, with NAIR is actually access to AI hardware. Uh, it's in short supply, uh, and it's very expensive, and that is one of the enablers uh, for basic research in AI. So there are, there are challenges as well as opportunity. That great sucking sound is talent often leaving academia uh, to pursue opportunities in the private sector, uh, and interesting opportunities at that. So those, those whole set of issues around uh, the federal role in AI is deeply tied up with the Chips and Science Bill as well, because uh, semiconductor uh, access and national security issues are a deep part of that. Uh, and so I'm going to hand the floor to Ponch briefly to yes. introduce our uh, uh, two commentators, uh, and then we'll have a chance for some discussion. So welcome to you, and over to you, Ponch. Thank you, Chair. Um, you know, I'm, I'm thrilled to have this amazing leadership in AI at NSF and at various levels across the agency. And uh, Tess Plank Knowles, uh, she was at OSTP, and we were fortunate enough to have her back at NSF. She's a pioneer, she's a leader, and you have her bio. Uh, but I want to say that she's been doing a tremendous job in terms of making sure that all of the activities of NSF around AI is you know, appropriately coordinated and represented in the conversations that we have, both in the Hill as well as in, in the administration in the White House. And because of the executive order of the president, we are making sure that we are keeping true to all the deadlines. And in fact, you're here going to hear about the NAIR pilot, uh, which was 90-day, uh, you know, uh, sort of an outcome that we had to um, put together, and you'll hear about that. And there are many, many things like that, and she's keeping a close coordination of all of the things that we're doing in AI. So I'm very grateful to Tess for doing a great job as a leader. And then Dr. Michael Littman, again, um, 
uh, came to us as a program uh, officer and then now uh, division director. Uh, and he's been doing a phenomenal job leading all of the efforts in AI. And um, he came to us from Brown University and uh, Michael, his own area is in AI. And therefore it's nice to have people who represent that area, but also are the division director of the Information Intelligence Systems. And um, he's been doing a phenomenal job trying to see how we can inspire more of the AI Institute thinking, expand AI and a variety of AI programs through the size directorate and partnering with other directorates in advancing the AI priorities. So they have, and, and of course the AI education programs, we have monthly, uh, work once in every other week or two, once in three weeks, we have AI sessions with us and uh, they do a phenomenal job in terms of showing their progress. Okay, over to you both. Thank you. And thank you for the opportunity to join you today. Obviously, this is a topic that we love to talk about. So the goal of our presentation today, which we'll walk you through some brief slides, is to provide an overview of the many ways that NSF is supporting AI research, education, and innovation nationwide, and then how we're also integrating into some of these government-wide initiatives. So I'll pass it to Michael to kick us off. Thanks, Tess. Oh, I should advance the slide. So the, the chair made a joke about how AI is sort of everywhere all at once right now. Uh, it was not always so. Uh, it's one If one had not been paying close attention, it would seem that AI just sort of appeared out of nowhere. But in fact, AI research has been going on for many, many decades, and NSF has been investing in AI research for six decades. And um, I want to say a little bit about the things that we're seeing today and how they connect with uh, NSF investments of the past, because I think that's actually really important, and it's not always so visible. So first of all, I want to, I want to mention that, that when we're talking about AI, that what AI of today really consists of three major ingredients, people, data, and algorithms. And NSF has made substantial contributions to all three of those. One of the, uh, one of the topics that I think is at the front of a lot of people's minds these days are these amazing chatbots that can talk like people, even though they're clearly not people. Uh, these are built on top of a whole bunch of technologies that NSF has been investing in, uh, reinforcement learning, neural networks, large language models, just basically language technology more generally. These go back, some of them, uh, to the eighties and, and before the eighties. And, um, I want to, want to point out that, that, that it's really in the coming together of all these ideas that we get these chatbots that are so, so fluent and so capable of, of actually conversing with people. And just to remind everybody that they're really good talkers. They're not actually good thinkers so much. And so uh, let's, let's make sure that we don't depend too much on them to make decisions for us. But they're really a wonderful interface, a wonderful uh, uh, machine translator of language into something that's, that's digitally processable, which I think is really, really cool. But, there's, but really, that's not the only very exciting thing that's happened in the last few years in terms of artificial intelligence. Another topic that I want to mention is, uh, is AlphaFold, which is a, a system that if you're not familiar with it, it comes out of uh, the, the DeepMind uh, company, and it predicts protein structures based on amino acid sequences. And that's kind of a remarkable thing to be able to do. People have been working on that problem for at least 50 <laughs> years. And uh, it, it's finally been cracked. And I think a lot of people out in the world view that as a great contribution that industry has made to the sciences. And I don't think that's incorrect, but I think they often ignore the, the fundamental work that, that, that goes behind it. This, again, didn't, didn't appear out of nowhere. The, the computational biology methods and the AI methods that actually it are, it are built out of, uh, that, that AlphaFold is built out of, uh, were, were supported by NSF research for many, many years. The lead author, in fact, of the AlphaFold paper was trained in an NSF-supported lab at the University of Chicago in, in chemistry. It's also worth noting that the, the key ingredient that really made that whole system possible is that it was trained on a protein data bank. Now, without that protein data bank, none of this would have happened. They did a lot of interesting other work, but really that was the, that was the linchpin that really made this possible. And NSF has been supporting the Protein Data Bank since the 1970s. Like this resource would not exist if not for substantial input and, and investment from NSF. One other topic I want to mention is trustworthy AI, which I think gets a lot of play these days in, in, the, in the press and in uh, policymakers' perspectives on AI. And um, this is actually a much more recent topic. The socio-technical analysis really kind of came into its own in the mid-2010s. So, so much more recently. 
And NSF has played an incredible role in supporting the community that really has brought those ideas to people's attention and really started to form them in a way that, that has had substantial effect on the conversation, including the, uh, the Fairness and Accountability and Transparency Conference, which is kind of the main academic conference for studying these kinds of topics. All the founders uh, are, are NSF, have, have received NSF support for the kind of work that they do. And finally, I wanted to mention uh, con recent contributions in education, things like the Duolingo system, which is really exciting. There's AI throughout that whole system, and the Duolingo and the people who created it were all NSF supported at one time or another. <clears throat> so so if, if, if AI has been such a big thing for so long, what's different now? Why is it suddenly a cop topic of conversation? Is it that people just discovered it recently, or did something change? And I, in, in my thinking about this, I think there's really two major things that have shifted lately, and it's worth really thinking about them and their implications. So the first one is the implications of scale. So what people discovered that it, is that if you add enough data, compute, and, uh, and, and algorithms and run them long enough, you can actually shatter expectations for very, very difficult problems that people have been working on for a long time. So examples include speech recognition, image recognition and image generation, language processing and the DNA example that I talked about previously, none of these, like all of these were problems for, for quite a long time and they've all completely shifted in terms of their, their, their ability for people to solve them as a result of, of scaling up algorithms that mostly we already had. So this raises interesting scientific questions like what are these networks even learning and how can we characterize what they learn and harness it? Right? We don't just want black boxes that can solve our problems and maybe sometimes not solve our problems, but we really want to understand scientifically what's going on here. Now, the challenge here uh, is, is that we, to study something at scale requires much larger, if you will, microscopes or even telescopes than what we've had to date in the field. And so uh, to study the implications of scale, it's not something that a, a single researcher can just do on his or her own in the lab. It really requires major investments to have the resources to be able to run these kinds of studies. So NSF's response to this has been, for example, uh, putting together the AI institutes. That's been a, a great opportunity for people to look at the connection between these scaled up AI problems and, uh, and, and various kinds of use inspired applications. But I think of course the, the, the major one, the major response that NSF has, has, has made is in terms of the NAIR, uh, the National AI Research Resource which the idea of which is to make sure that researchers who are doing this, this kind of fundamental work have access to that scale that they need to be able to do the studies that are required to understand these systems. I mean, you're, you're going to be hearing more about the NAIR and the NAIR pilot, uh, so I'm not going to focus on this now. But I did want to mention some other things that are, are just very briefly that, that are not so visible but are really important, that we're seeing more and more proposals to, uh, for example, my division, my directorate, uh, in the form of community infrastructure proposals. Now, this maybe doesn't sound so surprising. We heard earlier about the, uh, the Antarctic station. This is a major piece of infrastructure that has had a tremendous impact on, on people and science. Uh, but for some reason, other computer scientists haven't really engaged in that kind of infrastructure investment activities in the past. And so we're starting to really see a, a cultural shift in the AI community where we're saying, oh yeah, we, we, we need each other. We need to work together. We need to, we need to obtain larger resources to be able to do this kind of work. So that's, that's one major component. The other, the other thing that has shifted that has really changed the conversation in AI is the problem of managing the socio-technical boundary. So the idea here is that, again, people have been studying AI for around 75 years, one way or another. What's new now, one of the things that's new now is that there's been success in the lab, that we've actually solved some really interesting hard problems, and people have gotten excited and put them out into the world. And what we discovered is that there are complex interactions with people and institutions when you bring these, these, this technology to bear uh, on a broad scale. So uh, things we're seeing include methods that seem to do great in the lab, 99.9% .9 accuracy, that actually fail dismally on subpopulations, particular under, underrepresented groups. Algorithms that exhibit biases in various ways, again, that seem to do great in the lab, but then when we actually apply them to real data and, and have them interact with real people, bad things happen. And new kinds of security concerns, right? So new ways that people can, uh, who, who wish to do harm can actually attack these systems and, and, uh, and undermine them. So there's some really deep and important scientific questions as a result. How do we bring societal perspectives into this kind of research, right? Again, traditionally, 
you can get a person, a couple people, a computer, a little bit of data, and you can do research. Now you really have to be thinking about things much more broadly. You need a systems viewpoint that what we're talking about here is not just an algorithm, not just a mathematical abstraction, but an entire uh, society and the and the way that that society is is impacted. So this is a, this brings various kinds of challenges up. Uh, for example, it's again a kind of scale. There's an implication of scale, but it's a different kind of scale. It's a scale that we get when we're actually applying these systems to uh, or across a broad group. And um, and to do that, we need multi multiple disciplinary perspectives, which means we really have to change the way this kind of research is done, and therefore the way that this kind of research is funded. NSF's response to this include things like, again, the AI institutes, but also, as, as Dr. Ponch pointed out, the, 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 the central role of partnerships, right? That we actually have to work together to solve a lot of these problems. They can't really be done by, by independent investigators. And we're starting to think about maybe just uh, putting together new kinds of test beds. So whereas traditionally in machine learning uh, and, and artificial intelligence, we can actually study a problem by running, it, running a data set through it and reporting accuracy measures. If we're really interested in this socio-technical boundary, we need to measure things about the impact of the technology on people. And that means the experimental setup has to include groups of people and, and, their, and how they're being influenced. And so that really requires a different perspective on how we test these algorithms. And, and I, again, I think NSF can, can help with the response to that. All right, so I wanna say a little bit about the overall strategy about the way that NSF has been thinking about investing in the AI of tomorrow. So really NSF is thinking about the, the broad spectrum of ways in which the technology can be designed kind of from, from fundamental first principles through thinking about uh, issues in trustworthy AI where you're, you're thinking about the implications uh, societally thinking about ways of applying AI to solve particular societal challenges where the AI isn't the focus, but the, the, the challenge is the focus and AI is the mechanism by which it, it could be addressed all the way through how these techniques can be translated. These research breakthroughs can be translated into uh, impact on the world and, and, and companies that support them. And cutting across both of those include supporting access to research infrastructure like the NAIR, but other, other ways that we're supporting infrastructure and developing the AI workforce of the future. So educational topics as well. So I just wanna mention uh, two programs before I uh, kind, of, kind of finish with, with this part of the presentation. One is, I mentioned several times the National AI Research Institutes. I'm sure that this has been talked about before, that you've thought about it before. Uh, in the year and a half that I've been at NSF, this <coughs> program has grown to 25 multi-organization AI institutes and roughly a half a billion dollar investment to advance fundamental and use-inspired AI. So this is really exciting. And a lot of times when, uh, when we're approached about, well, what are we doing in such and such area of an AI? Have you thought about this particular topic? Invariably, we can point to some aspect, something that's happening in one of the AI institutes where uh, this problem is being addressed. They're really doing a fantastic job. And so it's, uh, it's been about, I guess, four, ish years since the, the first uh, AI Institute was, was announced. And we're now, now that some of those er earliest institutes have been around for a couple of years, and we're starting to see the kinds of uh, breakthrough research that they're doing. And it's just so phenomenal. We got to see them uh, this past September. They, uh, all the institutes, representatives from all the institutes came, and we had a Hill Day uh, where we actually presented uh, what the institutes were doing to representatives on the Hill. And it was just, it was just heartwarming just to see how fantastic the work is, how excited they were about it, and all the positive impacts that they're having on the basic sciences, on education, on agriculture, just all these really great and important problems. Especially when you hear in the news, a lot of times people like to talk about all very lots of gloom and doom topics around AI. It was just such a nice antidote to that to see people really think about it. Oh, is that a question? Yeah, yeah is that uh, that five hundred million dollars is over what period of time? That's a good question. I don't think. Uh, it, yeah, it's, it's a five-year investment. Yeah. Uh, each of the institutes is a five-year-long uh, investment. So that's the. So uh, what we have is each institute is twenty million dollar scale. We have twenty-five institutes at five hundred million dollars. NSF has invested for fifteen of equivalent to fifteen of them. That is three hundred million dollars. The other two hundred million dollars are through our partners, interagency partners. For example, USDA invested in five of them, hundred million dollars. All five of them are ag institutes, AI institutes. And then a consortium of industry, uh, Microsoft, Google, Accenture, and Intel 
put in $20 million equivalent. So uh, like an AI Institute equivalent. So we have Department of Transportation, you know, um, all, the, all the agencies that you would think that would be a partner are all partnering in this. Yeah, NIST, NIST has got a special institute. Um, it's is, is it a good thing or a bad thing when your boss knows so much about what you do? <laughs> <laughs> it's a fantastic thing. He's very engaged in, in all aspects. Uh, speaking of which, another topic that he probably knows about <laughs> more than I do, uh, is the, the uh, recently announced NSF Regional Innovation Engines Program. So we've heard, of that, heard about that a couple times today already, but I just wanted to focus on one particular aspect of it, which is that um, the, the 10 inaugural NSF engines, seven of them actually focus on applications of AI. And if you look at the titles of them, it's not so obvious that things like water and climate and aerospace uh, energy. These aren't AI topics per se, but the way that these teams are actually trying to address these extremely hard problems is making sure that AI concepts are kind of threaded through the entire structure of, of what they do. So just as a quick example, the Illinois-based Great Lakes Water Innovation Engine is about uh, developing intelligent water resource recovery systems. And so the way they're doing that is by leveraging leading AI capabilities to support sustainable water intensive industry, right? So, so helping them make their decisions, uh, they're, they're including AI kind of in all aspects of the way that the system is designed. The North Dakota Advanced Agriculture Technology Engine on Sustainable Agriculture actually combines advanced sensor technologies. So, so, to, so the, the machines can actually see what's going on, crop and genetic data so that there's something to process and AI and climate modeling technology to actually bring those to bear to, to make better decisions about sustainable agriculture. So this is all on top of the NSF engine development awards, which were is issued last spring to help regions prepare to apply for full NSF engines. And among the, those uh, proposals that were considered 15 of them focused on, on AI applications. I think it was about a third of, the, of them in some way just had AI as a core topic. So what I'm going to do next is uh, turn it over to Tess, who's going to talk about infrastructure, education, and broader government engagement. Thanks. Thanks, Michael. Um, so as Michael mentioned, as part of that kind of holistic support of NSF for the AI innovation ecosystem, we support the foundational elements that we really see as kind of powering that discovery and innovation process. So in terms of the infrastructure, we play a really central role in connecting researchers to those resources that they need to fuel AI research. Michael talked about them in terms of the data, the data resources, the computational resources, um, uh, obviously the algorithms, and then the talent as well. I mean, we've seen with the advent of machine learning, um, access to high quality data sets and the computational resources is really defining the ability to, to work at the cutting edge. And so we're starting to see this growing divide between researchers in the private sector who have access particularly to the computational resources that they need and researchers in academia and small businesses who don't always have the resources to really work with today's large models. And so as um, because of this, you know, one of our flagship efforts in this space um, is the National AI Research Resource, or NAIR pilot, um, which we were directed to stand up in the recent AI executive order, and we just launched at the end of last month. Um, so I know you're going to get an opportunity to talk about it further, but so I won't go into much detail now. But I will note that this pilot, which is a kind of a first step towards a national infrastructure that would connect researchers to these data, computational, uh, and training resources, it really builds on prior work we have in this space. So um, NSF funded the Cloud Bank pilot, and this is a pathway for um, size directorate researchers to access computing resources across a range of commercial cloud platforms. Um, we also have uh, funded the NSF Frontera supercomputer. Hundreds of US researchers um, access the supercomputer each year, and it's actually specifically um, equipped to accelerate AI and machine learning research. On the data side of things, one of um, the interesting uh, programs we have underway um, is around developing a prototype of an open knowledge network. This is actually a partnership with five other federal agencies, um, and it's focused on de uh, developing integrated knowledge graphs based on publicly available data that's provided by the agencies, um, really to kind of mirror the knowledge graph technology that the private sector has to develop advanced um, AI applications and, and, and consumer applications. And of course, the other critical foundational element to all of this um, is talent. Um, so we are supporting the cultivation of this you know, broader AI workforce from K through 12 education to experiential learning opportunities to um, access to advanced degrees. 
And what we're really focused on is advancing AI expertise and knowledge at, at the many levels that we see are going to be needed to integrate AI into society um, and into the workforce. Yes, sir. Well, beside the workforce, as you start, as folks start to develop these large language models, what institutions are you engaging in terms of the research side of this, in terms of to make sure that these language models are diverse in their inputs? You do want to talk about that? Yeah, so, so maybe not so surprisingly, uh, the, the flavor of proposals that, we, that we've been getting in the last year has shifted dramatically. As, as, as the researchers have realized, hey, this is kind of an exciting topic. There's a lot we can do with this. We're seeing proposals uh, from the entire research community on, on, on topics related to language models. We're, we're also looking particularly at how we can uh, help support the development of large language models that are open that, that where we can actually uh, understand all the inputs that went into them. Uh, a lot of the, the work that we're, a lot of the work that the research community is doing now is built on top of things like either Llama from Meta or on top of uh, ChatGPT from OpenAI. And we don't actually know what data went into any of those. Yeah, well, I'm just at, my question is more, more direct in the sense of what institutions, HBCUs, MSIs, <clears throat> not just workforce, because that's one piece, but are also involved in the research that is going on. Are you funding any currently now under your current awards? I will have to get back to you on, on the particulars there, but if, yeah. if I can mention, I think one kind of exemplar program we have in this space is the Expand AI program. <laughs> <laughs> and this, um, this actually leverages that network of AI research institutes um, and pairs MSIs um, with these institutes to build their AI research and education capacity. So it's really about leveraging what we already have there to build the capacity across diverse institutions to not just educate the workforce, but really to be involved in the research side as uh, well. Vic, one thing that I want to add is all the 25 AI institutes have outreach components. Mm -hmm. In fact, one of the AI institutes in the, in the Southeast, Tuskegee is a partner. So you will find that number of these AI institutes have partnership with K-12 institutions, minority serving institutions. So even over the last four years, we have expanded the, how we have touched the, the training and skill development in AI through the AI institutes, in addition to the new Expand AI program. Mm -hmm. yeah. Could you tell me what, more about K-12 education? Yes, absolutely. Um, and so we actually just in December launched an Educate AI initiative. Um, and this is again, kind of fulfilling some of the mandates in the AI executive order that's intended to um, enable educators um, to bring um, educational opportunities um, into their classrooms. We're starting with K through 12 um, and undergraduate, and then we're going to be expanding to um, community college and reskilling initiatives. Um, and this um, Educate AI initiative builds on prior work that we've done in this space. And so um, through our AI for K-12 initiative, we funded the creation of AI educational standards um, that are accessible to educators across the, um, across the nation right now. Um, and this initiative also funded um, a training resources for educators and kind of exemplar um, work plans that they could bring into the classroom to start to really integrate AI into their curricula. And we're intending to expand on this work going forward through the Educate AI initiative. Um, I'll also mention um, one of our new initiatives to provide um, uh, experiential learning opportunities. So to provide an opportunity for folks at kind of whatever level they are in their career to experiment with um, an AI career path. And so this is through our newly launched experiential learning uh, for emerging and novel technologies program that um, it covers all technology areas but has some focus on AI. Um, and then, of course, in this kind of broader workforce and education space, the longstanding um, graduate research fellowships program and our newer, newer CS grad for U.S. Um, program are making um, graduate studies in AI available to, to more students across the country. And so, of course, as we've been moving forward across those pillars of investment, um, we've been doing so in the context of increased attention on AI from policymakers. Um, and this is both from the White House um, as well as Congress. Um, so we've mentioned this, but in October of last year, President Biden signed the executive order on the safe, secure and trustworthy development and use of AI. And this built on prior administration work to develop a blueprint for an AI Bill of Rights, as well as NIST's work to develop an AI risk management framework, and really represents a, a comprehensive approach in terms of um, the federal government moving forward on AI, in terms of managing risks, but also harnessing opportunities. Um, it is so comprehensive, that's actually the longest EO in American history, as we heard from our White House colleagues. Um, and if you dig into it, it is quite, um, quite comprehensive and long. 
Um, so the, there's several key goals um, in the ex executive order. There's really a strong focus on how we can protect Americans from risky models and risky uses of those models. Um, it's a lot about supporting workers, both in terms of the integration of AI into their workplaces and then as they build the skills to interact with AI um, in, a, in a future AI-driven economy. Um, and there's a focus on how we can figure out how to use AI to, to solve problems for society, and that's a big space for, for NSF to play in, as well as how to strengthen the government's own ability to integrate AI into uh, operations to more efficiently and effectively um, achieve agency missions. And then um, uh, expanding AI talent, both in terms inside of government, and there's a big focus on this AI talent surge that was directed in the executive order, and then in the broader ecosystem. And again, that's where NSF has a clear role to play. And of course, there's a, a strong focus on um, safety, testing, and validation of AI systems and advancing um, the science and standards to do so. So NSF has several tasks in the executive order that are very much tied to the role that we play in supporting research, regional innovation, uh, and building the education and workforce opportunities. And you can see those listed here on the left. Um, and they all build on work that, ha that we have underway, much of which Michael and I have, have touched on already. And we're also um, in a supporting role for several tasks, so such as that led by commerce around developing test beds for AI, and Michael talked about some of the ways that we're thinking about that, um, as well as working with DOE to expand opportunities to train scientists um, in AI. Um, and then we're working closely with state and USAID as they develop a global AI research agenda. Um, and so um, in addition to this increased um, attention uh, from the White House on kind of moving forward holistically on AI. We've seen increased um, uh, attention from Congress on AI-related issues. I mean, this is really intensified, I think, probably the past two years. And so, and so in the Senate um, last fall, Senator Schumer led a process to hold a series of what were called AI insight forums. And these brought together diverse speakers, so tech leaders, former government officials, um, academic, civil society representatives to really talk through some of the key issues in the AI environment right now. So from risk to innovation, workforce, role of AI in democracy and elections, and privacy and liability. And this is really intended to kind of set the foundation for future legislation. And then as the chair mentioned just yesterday, the House announced the launch of the uh, bipartisan AI task force to, to start a similar process on the House side. I mean, so we've, you know, fielded a lot of interest um, from, from our colleagues in Congress um, on issues ranging from uh, the NAIR pilot, there's a lot of interest there, um, as well as um, AI education, um, AI and cybersecurity, these kind of connection points between AI and semiconductors and cybersecurity. And I actually had the opportunity early this month uh, to participate in a hearing in front of um, two subcommittees of the um, Committee on um, Science, Space, and Technology. Um, that was focused on the topic of um, AI and driving scientific innovation, but really heavily focused on the NAIR, uh, the NAIR pilot and the pathway to a full-scale NAIR through the CREATE AI Act. Yes, sir. Fantastic. Just want to know, are you also working, I see DOE, are you working with Craig Martell's office? He's the Chief Digital and Artificial Intelligence Officer for the Pentagon. So are you all talking? Yes, we are connected to them and they actually have, there's some interesting opportunities, I think, on the workforce front. They're expanding their outreach to HBCUs. I think there might be some clear partnership efforts there. And then I'll also mention on the um, AI institutes, we've partnered with DOD on one of those as well. So to close, um, you know, there, we see several kind of key challenges ahead that will need to be overcome so that we can kind of meet this goal of having a really vibrant, equitable, and responsible AI innovation ecosystem. Um, so we have them listed here. You know, there's always the challenge of funding levels. You know, every year we receive more well-rated proposals on AI that we can fund. And um, as Michael mentioned, you know, the situation is being exacerbated by this, this higher cost. Um, for AI-driven efforts when they when they involve significant amount of compute or, or standing up of infrastructure. Um, AI and education um, also presents a challenge just in terms of the depth and the breadth of the needs, you know, from basic AI literacy to making sure that we have that strong STEM foundations at K through 12, to expanding undergraduate opportunities to more universities, and then retraining opportunities as well for, for adults kind of later in their careers. And we see significant work on kind of each of these areas to really make it so that there are pathways and opportunities into AI research, career paths and jobs available across the country. Um, we have also, we're also seeing a growing um, demand for the integration of AI into other domains of science and engineering. And we really see that 
that's what's going to be needed to really um, enable the potential of AI to accelerate the discovery um, process across these fields. And then, you know, realizing that is going to require us to build more opportunities for researchers earlier in their careers to learn about AI techniques, integrate it into their work, and then also providing opportunities for, for researchers later in their careers to then kind of um, uh, learn about um, AI techniques and opportunities. And then finally, there's just the pace of innovation. You know, the field is moving so fast, and that sometimes presents a challenge when measured against our own kind of internal um, funding uh, and uh, decision-making processes and really just making sure that we're funding the cutting edge um, from our side. Um, so with that, we very much welcome the board's feedback on opportunities as we try to address these challenges going forward, um, as well as, you know, other ways that, that you see where we can strengthen our approach to, to you know, fostering this AI ecosystem. All right, thank you both. Uh, we've got three hands up. We'll start there. Suresh Garamella, Marvi, uh, and then Suresh Babu. Yeah, just, um, just to start off, I mean, we were hoping for an AI panel this time, and I understand we'll have one later, but you guys are just great. Um, great to hear from expertise internally, right? And division directors and uh, ADs and all, I think you hold a lot of expertise, and I hope we, uh, for future meetings, actually hear more from you. Um, because you have the pulse of where things are going. So um, so I think this is great. Uh, Michael, uh, I guess I, you know, I want to hear about the doom and gloom too. <laughs> um, w there is a lot of concern in the community. And I, so I'll, I have three short questions, maybe not so short. I'll ask them all. Um, so if you could just comment on how you're fielding those, right? When you go to um, hearings and all that, um, these are real concerns. And so w what is your general take on it? How complementary or coordinated are your efforts with the work being funded by other agencies? I guess, how real is that coordination? And, uh, and to Tess, I think, just I may have misheard you, but are you saying that the, some subset of GRF, GRFPs are targeted at AI, or is it a different pot of money um, supporting graduate fellowships in AI? So three questions, sorry. Yeah, sure, all right. Uh, can I hold the three questions in my head all at once? All right, so uh, doom and gloom. I think that was sort of the setting for at least question one. We actually had a doom and gloom slide in the slide deck. It was deemed too doomy and gloomy. Um, but the, what I was going to say to the slide, I, I basically in, in my travels, I've heard maybe 20 different kind of uh, concerns that people have. They all come from kind of different directions, and they all have some degree of legitimacy to them. One of the reasons that I, I wanted to share the slide is because NSF is doing something on all those fronts, right? It's, we're, we're actually acknowledging these, these issues and we're doing various things to, to help kind of intervene uh, and, and at least increase our understanding of what, what goes on behind them. I, um, I like to think that um, the sort of my, my motto for this current AI moment is it, it's not as bad as you think, <laughs> which is to say that it's not not bad. Like there are some issues that we really have to be paying attention to, but I think a lot of times it gets very much overblown and, and, the, and the questions are sort of like, well, wait, if we just, if we take this idea, this bad thing that happened, if we just projected it everywhere, then the whole world would end. It's like, yes, that's true, but that's not, no one's doing that. Like, no one's gonna project it to that level. So, so um, at, a, at a high level, I just wanna say that, um, yeah, that acknowledge that there are concerns, but also that uh, we've just got this amazing nation of researchers who are engaged in these questions, and they're taking these things really seriously, and they're coming up with brilliant ways of kind of addressing them. So there's going to maybe be a little bit of turbulence at the moment, you know, it's, we hit a pocket of air, but um, but it's going to it, it'll smooth out as people try to understand and and come to grips with what the the issues really are and how to do this right. And I can I can speak to our integration with the interagency as well, and we're very much um, closely aligned with particularly NIST. If you read in the um, executive order, it gets a lot of tall tasks in terms of moving forward on AI safety validation um, and setting up that kind of infrastructure to do so. And they've set up their, um, they just announced the, the US AI Safety Institute that's going to be pioneering a lot of this work. And so we are connected with them because there are a lot of open questions in the research space that are going to need to drive those efforts as NIST tries to identify what are the best practices today and then continually to integrate what the research community develops to the best practices of tomorrow. So one of the kind of um, uh, concrete ways we've done this just recently 
um, is through the NAIR pilot. And we worked with NIST to scope the first call for um, access to resources through the NAIR pilot around trustworthy AI to really focus on the key questions that they are tackling through the AI Safety Institute so that we are supporting the research and the connection of those researchers to the computational resources they need to move forward on those lines of effort. And the last thing was about the GRF yes. GRFPs. Yeah. So the on the GRFP program, um, it does support a number of um, uh, students each year who are pursuing studies in AI. And then we also have the CS Grad for US program, which is a size-led um, initiative that, that focuses primarily on com computer science and graduate degrees. So through both those programs, we're supporting advanced degrees in AI. So if I could add one more thing, um, one of the AI institutes Recent AI institutes are actually funded by NIST and Law Ethics and Society from the University of Maryland. Um, you know, the, in this area, I think it's exceedingly important not to be arrogant about technology and science being the basis of solving these problems. It's to acknowledge the fact that we need these interdisciplinary social behavioral sciences, uh, humanities, you know, law ethics, all of that being components of trying to find solutions. So what NSF is trying to do increasingly is to acknowledge that. And even within the agency working across our directorates, in conceptualizing calls, as well as you know, intentionally building these kinds of institutes with our partners so that we are actually tackling the problem. It is, it is a problem. It is a problem. We acknowledge it, and we are trying to see what are the best groups we can bring to, to the table, what are the best disciplines we can bring to the table. That's what NSF ought to be doing, and I think there is a good effort in that regard. Thank you. So maybe if I can jump in there, and then we'll go. Uh, Maria, Asresh Babu, Scott. Uh, Matt and I did, Mel, you have your okay, um, which is maybe a, I don't want to put words in Suresh's mouth, but I'll ask the question this way: In high-profile areas where there's a critical national need, is there potential advantage of allocating a subset of of those GRFPs to those critical areas as opposed to an open call? Yeah, and I think that has been done in the past where they've had call outs in the GRFP solicitation for those critical technology areas. So I think it is a mechanism we've used in the past in terms of um, focusing um, to, to advance in those critical technology areas. I'm sure the director- No, I think we have done this. You're right, we, we have done this in the past. And one of the things that you will notice is when you look at the GRFP recipients itself, because the AI area is so hot, they get a lot more applications and the outcome speaks for itself in terms of a lot more of those going to these areas that you would think that we need to prioritize, quantum or AI or things of that nature. So, so my concern was just that uh, AI is wonderful, but you know, is it disadvantaging others, especially if it's not a stated goal that some of these will be given to AI, in which case it almost should be you know, partitioned off. So I, you know, we don't want to sort of behind the scenes prioritize or, or, you know, AI over other areas, uh, unless we say we are. Right, and I, I think it's complicated, right? Because a lot of people are now saying they're doing AI that weren't doing AI before, right? And so they're, they're, we're trying to find ways of balancing, like the people who are kind of core AI people who've been doing it for a while and, and making sure that they can continue to kind of create those foundations that other things are built on, but at the same time acknowledging this is really influential and important for other areas as well. And so we wanna make sure that they're supported as well. And so it's been, you know, it's a, it's a balancing act. I think that we're doing the best that we can. Okay, Marvi, uh, Suresh Babu, Scott, Matt, uh, and then uh, Mel. Um, thank you for your contributions to the field and um, for your uh, great presentation. Um, so uh, I have two questions. Uh, my first question actually has to do with product life cycle product, and I would say also data life cycle. And so um, from an evolution of the technology perspective, there are um, two considerations that I have right now in mind, and that is you know, the use and creation of energy intense uh, technologies and also um, data pollution, software created data that then you can't really distinguish really well with the tools that exist today from real data, right? And so I would call these both product life cycle, you know, issues. Um, and so my first question is, how are we dealing with those, right? Um, and these are just two examples of those product life cycle issues. Um, and the second question actually has to do with um, competition versus collaboration. Many of the um, of the you know 
I guess, initiatives that and efforts that we have put forward have to do with um, um, or would depend on high collaboration. But our the way that we uh, measure performance of both people and institutions actually lead to competition. So when you think about, you know, cloud services, you know, network services, open data, open knowledge, all of that requires a lot of collaboration. Um, so how do you balance the two and actually create a culture um, within the institutes and within the community that leads to collaboration? So two very different questions. <laughs> Thank you. All right. Um, so so the uh, the two kinds of pollution that you mentioned are actually really interesting. There's the kind of physical pollution of the world using up natural resources. And then there's like information and data pollution. So so one of the ways that we're thinking about the, the, the question of the actual environment is we've got a program in the size directorate called Design for Environmental Sustainability in Computing or DESC, where the emphasis there is, is partly on how can we make computations themselves more energy efficient? And that way we can scale them up without requiring so many resources. But that's actually been a fairly well-studied problem in computing for, for decades. One of the new angles is to think about the product life cycle itself. The actual physical computers are also very energy intensive to create. And then if they're gonna be replaced in a year and a half, two years, that's creating additional waste. So how can we actually be, des be designing the computer systems themselves so that it is more, more of a sustainable process? So um, yeah, so we're, we're funding people to, to work on exactly those kinds of problems. On the information pollution side, one of the things that we're thinking about is, is, I mean, so, okay, so large language models tend to be built by slurping up all available data, including the dirty data and the data that may have actually been produced by previous language models and therefore isn't really adding anything to the story. Um, ideally, we wouldn't be actually building these, these systems this way, that the large language models could potentially be built with a lot fewer language resources, in which case we could actually focus on high quality data and not just slurp up everything, including the sludge that was, that was created in previous iterations. So one of the ways we're studying that is by looking at, for example, low resource languages. So not just English, where we've got tons of stuff out there, but like what's going on in, in Hawaiian? Like how do we build a language model for, for Hawaiian? Uh, how can we build uh, language models for African languages and so forth? And so th I think that's actually helping us get it, at least in part at this question of what do we do when, when some, some of the information that's out there is really questionable. There's also questions of um, data quality and, and misinformation and so forth that are, some of these are actually very sensitive topics because one person's misinformation is another person's argument in favor of a different policy. Uh, and so we're, we tread very, very lightly on that space, but the, nonetheless, there's really important scientific questions there and we try to engage with them as, as, as well as we can. So I just wanna remind us, we're pretty close to the end of this session. We have a, a narrow discussion over lunch. I don't wanna shortchange that either. So please try to be brief. So just briefly you. to your, sorry, competition and collaboration, I want to make sure we get to that question. So I think you've kind of heard of the ways that we structure some of these programs like the AI Institute. So each institute is actually a consortium of organizations. And then as the director said, they all have uh, the mandate to reach out into their communities through educational opportunities through community colleges and K through 12. And so we're structuring a lot of these opportunities to enhance this collaboration between the different institutions that we see as needed to kind of move the field forward. And then as Michael mentioned, we're also seeing the field start to move forward in terms of this identification that they're going to need these kind of collaborative resources, and we want to support that as well um, in, in the future. I have a brief question. Thank you very much for that. One of the things I really like about is AI for education. How are you going to make sure this data, which is used by these AI tools, are kept available for open and veracity is checked all the time? So that I checked many times, it doesn't agree with my own papers many times. So how do you handle this problem with that? Yeah, and so this, I mean, this is a challenge that the whole AI community is kind of grappling with right now, right? In terms of the data sets that are being used to train models. If, you know, they've, if the data sets are found to have kind of faulty data in that, do you then clean them up? Then you have to retrain. And there's the reproducibility question. So there's there's many kind of open questions in this space around data. I see that the, the NARE 
pilot and hopefully the future NARE can have a really significant role in kind of bringing the community together to develop some sort of standards around um, and best practices around the management of these big data sets. Obviously, the, the pilot itself and then the future NARE will have a role in making available, you know, open, high quality data sets for the, for the research environment. But then I think it has kind of this underlying role as well as kind of building these community standards around um, best practices and in, in AI data management and also uh, best practices for when challenges have been identified with data sets, how to move forward as a community. Uh, thank you so much for your presentation today. Uh, coming from the opposite side of collaboration, could you touch on your policies regarding access and security? Is this open to everyone? Is it limited to American persons? Uh, what's the policy there? When you say it, you mean like the NAIR? Yeah. So I would, I'm gonna, I'm gonna, if it's okay, just push that question off to the next session where we're gonna get into detail about us. But but you would get to hear about details uh, of the NAIR that include all that sort of information. But very briefly, uh, <laughs> Tess will say very briefly. Yeah. Um, for the NAIR, um, it's envisioned to be accessible for US based researchers. So you have to be affiliated with the US organization, be it a um, research organization or a startup, small business. And care is being taken on the security side as well. I wanted to remind you, you do need to have one clear guardrail to avoid one pitfall. You alluded to it. It comes to decision making, particularly decision making, well, you called it societal decision making, particularly things that involve um, political controversial questions. Because, of course, one of the big uh, pillars you're doing is content recommendation and filtering. Is it what you put in AI, AI determines mm -hmm. what you get out? And as you said, uh, Dr. Littman, about, about disinformation, the AI will have to decide uh, what is disinformation or just uh, disagreeable political opinions. And as you said right there, uh, you should tread light on it. Uh, that research that we're talking about now, unfortunately, I think NSF cannot support at all. You can't tread there at all because of the problems with the First Amendment that many people see about it. Thanks. I just like to see the, the, the gloom and doom slide. <laughs> uh, I'll send you email. Or maybe I won't. <laughs> but uh, no, I mean, it's stuff that you, you could uh, you just look at the headlines in, in the paper. Right? There's just a whole lot of topics that people talk about in terms of uh, intellectual property, in terms of um, changing the way that, that education works because now suddenly students can just ask the computer to do their homework for them. Like what, what are the implications of that? All the way to is AI gonna rise up and just kill us all, right? And so these are the sorts of things that are expressed. And I think all of them to some degree are completely overblown, but all of them have a germ of truth in it that we need to address. And, and I think also a takeaway um, is that NSF is supporting work um, on kind of the technical side of these things to help develop the solutions in terms of content authentication. Um, and uh, data provenance. So really kind of developing the best practices to, to try to address some of these challenges um, that, are, that are coming up in the ecosystem. All right, I wanna thank you both uh, for a fulsome conversation. We've got uh, um, uh, a follow-up. So um, we're gonna adjourn here uh, for lunch. Thank you. Great job, guys. great job. All right, so here's the deal, folks. Um, for those of you on the board, lunch is available in 2010. Grab it, come back here. All right, welcome back everyone. Uh, we'll pick up here after lunch. Um, and at this point, we'll turn to approval of the open board, min uh, board meeting minutes. I can say these words. 
uh, from the November 2023 uh, uh, meeting. Uh, they're in the diligent board book uh, tab 2.4. Are there any corrections to the minutes? Here we know corrections. Uh, they'll stand as presented. Uh, at this point, we will turn to uh, the beginning of committee reports. Uh, and so we're going to begin with the uh, committee. OK, on external engagement and uh, in a miracle of technology, just in time, Dario has <laughs> appeared. Uh, and so I'll hand the floor over to him uh, for uh, the beginning of the, the updates. Dario. OK, well, thank you very much, Dan. And uh, to all, as you heard earlier from Dan, uh, we're continuing to talk with Congress and others about the urgency to address the STEM talent crisis to meet critical needs, um, both across government and, and industry. Now, a couple of important sort of observations. So, so first, uh, data from the board science and engineering indicators are really foundational to illustrating uh, the urgency. And I'll just highlight a few examples. Um, a national mathematics assessment in 2022 captured the largest decline in scores for fourth and eighth graders over the past 33 years, with a disproportionate drop for students who are Black, Hispanic, and from low-income families, and already scoring in the lowest 10th percentile. Second, there were nearly 1.4 million fewer undergraduates enrolled in 2022 than before the pandemic, and community colleges enrollment fell by 351,000 students between 21 and 22. And STEM jobs continue to grow faster than non-STEM jobs. And yet we know, as the board has been discussing with Congress and, and others, that government agencies such as the Department of Defense and industry sectors are struggling to meet current workforce needs in areas like semiconductors and AI, cyber, and quantum. So as Marine will talk in a minute, NSB will publish uh, its congressionally mandated State of US Science and Engineering report next month. We also plan to concurrently release a policy brief that will highlight indicators data that uh, further underscore the urgency to do much more to develop our domestic talent and to welcome international talent. In just a few minutes, Marine will lead a discussion on a draft of this brief called Talent is the treasure. And finally, in the coming months, as Marvi and Julia will report on shortly, the board's national security and talent working groups will work to provide additional policy briefs on key data, such as on the skilled technical workforce that the board will then use in engaging with policymakers, industry leaders, and others. And uh, very lastly, we will hold our next uh, external engagement retreat on April 22nd. So I'll give it back to you, Dan. Thank you, Dario. Um, any questions or comments on, on that summary? Seeing none, I'll, I will, uh, well, Maureen is not quite here yet. So let me uh, um, expand a little bit um, on a, a couple of things that Dario just said. We are planning to roll out uh, the indicators next month. Uh, and at, at this point, we're expecting to do that in collaboration with the White House. Uh, we plan to do it um, uh, with uh, uh, broader participation and highlighting the critical issues that Dario just mentioned, the, uh, the decline in, in STEM performance um, post COVID that continues uh, the critical need for workforce and the broad set of issues around that. I think it uh, it really is incumbent upon us, and we just spent most of the morning talking about uh, the challenges and opportunities around AI, uh, which uh, that is only one critical technology for uh, economic uh, continued economic security, but also deeply tied to broader national security issues. That how we ensure we have a broad, deep bench of uh, STEM educated talent that's representative of the broad diversity of the population is really critical to our future. I mentioned in the, uh, my opening remarks, our conversation with nonprofits and AAAS around um, this whole set of issues around how we communicate that need in a, in a coherent way uh, in order to move political action. Uh, and with that set up, I'll hand the floor over to Maureen uh, to talk about um, 
the uh, um, SEP policy and the, and the treasurer, uh, Talon is a treasurer uh, policy brief. Maureen. Well, thank you very much, Dan. Uh, in my uh, report out today, I'll spend a few minutes on committee projects. So first, an overview of some of our work and our goals for this board cycle. Uh, of course, we will cover science and engineering indicators 2024. The release of the state of US science and engineering uh, is coming out next month. So middle, middle of the month. Uh, and in a moment, we'll discuss and vote on a policy message or messages to accompany the rollout of this uh, policy neutral report. But we're also looking ahead to indicators 2026 uh, in collaboration with our colleagues at the National Center for Science and Engineering Statistics. We're hoping to make some pretty significant changes that will make indicators maximally useful for all of our key stakeholders and hopefully attract some new stakeholders as well. Uh, we're also trying to um, streamline the reports, make them easier for people to use and make them easier for us to produce as a way of making the data more accessible. And finally, we're gonna hear from the two SEP policy teams that have been working um, and are still hard at work on uh, topics of national security and STEM talent. So much of the committee's effort is in support of the board's priority of addressing the national STEM talent crisis uh, in close coordination with the external engagement committee. So let's turn first to uh, indicators 2024. So the committee and the board have all been, as I'm sure you're, you're, you will recall, have been hard at work uh, reviewing and releasing the thematic reports. So many thanks to our NCSCS collaborators uh, and authors who prepare these reports. Uh, since we last met, two reports have been released. So the publications output, US trends and international comparisons, and the science and technology public perceptions, awareness and information sources. So those, those two reports for our cycle are out. And I encourage everyone who's watching today to check out these reports uh, and their important findings. Four more thematic reports on innovation, knowledge and technology intensive industries, the STEM workforce, and research and development are planned for release before our next board meeting in May. So they are in final stages of preparation and will be going out within the next couple of months. Uh, the summary report or the state of the US science and engineering, which is uh, serves as our board's congressional deliverable, will be released in mid-March. And this report examines our nation's science and engineering enterprise in a global context, tracking STEM talent, discovery, and translation of findings into industry and society. So I am very excited about the quality of these reports and, and um, to some extent also very concerned about the data that they present. We have, we have some pretty uh, depressing and, and important findings being reported uh, that, that uh, I think deserve a great deal of attention for the nation and for people making decisions. Uh, the SCP has also been working to develop policy companion pieces to release with our policy neutral indicators report. Each cycle, the committee works hard to develop a product that reflects the board's consensus and aligns with the board's priorities and is deeply rooted in the data and the analysis that comes out of the science and engineering indicators report. So you'll find a draft of this um, policy piece uh, in your board book on tab 2.6. Our tentative title at this point is uh, Talent is the Treasure. And it works to synthesize across a large number of topics that we have spent a lot of time discussing and, and working on. So key indicators from the indicator suite, uh, including the K through 12 test scores that have just come out, global comparisons of AI publications and basic research funding. All of our board's discussions, many discussions on STEM talent crisis and talent policy messaging and recommendations that the SAP has incubated for the last couple of years. Uh, talent topics of highest importance for the board clearly are the pre-K uh, pre uh, training and preparation of students for STEM, STEM uh, to, to enter the STEM workforce, uh, the important role of socioeconomic status and affordability in STEM education, the skilled technical workforce that we've we've focused on for 
for a, a long while now, addressing the missing millions uh, and addressing uh, the issues of foreign-born talent, our, both our reliance on foreign-born STEM talent and the challenges in recruiting and retaining people from talent from other countries uh, to, to uh, supply our workforce. So before we begin any discussion of this draft document, I'd like to remind the board members today that our discussion should not include any specifics about the data that uh, and analysis that are present in the indicators. So the data contents of the documents is embargoed until March when the summary report is released. So please limit your discussion to uh, high level topics about this policy messaging or to data that have already been released in the thematic reports that I mentioned earlier have, have already been issued in this cycle. And if you have any specific feedback on the document or on the details or on the data or on any analysis uh, contained in it, please send written comments to myself, to Suresh and to, and to Amanda so that we can, we can address those um, address those concerns. Also in your board book, uh, this is just a first draft of, of, our, of our policy piece. Uh, to provide sort of a look and feel, I'd like to be clear that additional um, edits in response to both the written feedback and any discussion we have today uh, can certainly be incorporated. Uh, there's gonna be further copy editing and design improvements, clarifications, uh, and we will certainly do our best to incorporate any suggestions that are made today by, by board members. Um, if you would like to send written comments, please try to do so by close of business on February 26th, just so we can stay current with our, our uh, production scheduling. So with that, uh, do we have any discussion about, about this, this piece that's in your board book? Julia? Yeah, um, well, I'm, del I'm delighted to see it, I've read well, actually, this is not the first draft, as you as you well know. It's probably about the thirty fifth one, um, and it keeps getting better with with every every iteration. Um, I'm really pleased to see how it it actually dovetails very nicely with the last policy companion that we yes. had, um, which was a little covered more more topics, but it did hit this one pretty hard. Um, it is um, it it um, also covered. Um, provides a wonderful sort of umbrella under which all of the policy things that the two working groups um, are working on pretty hard. And so I think we have the opportunity to really get a really good one, two or one, two, three punch on, on those. And, you know, I've always said the first time you say something, it doesn't get hurt anyway, you might be preparing the soil and then the seed germinates as with kind of repeated telling and fertilization. So, so um, I like it very much. I think it's, I think it's um, hard hitting. Um, I've provided some um, specific comments, but, um, but in general, I think it's really good. Wonderful, wonderful. You're, you're, I value your opinion quite highly. So <laughs> I'm really glad to see that this is improving and that, and I agree with Julia that I think it does provide some really good context for, um, for perhaps even more focused follow-up pieces from, from the working groups. Any other thoughts or ideas or input? Any other questions or comments? Or questions? I'll just say, uh, sorry, Suresh. Yeah, yeah, following up on Julia, I guess, how do we fertilize? <laughs> how do we fertilize? <laughs> um, that is, that is a, that's a tough question. I mean, I think making it available to, to people that are the same people that are going to be receiving the, the summary report is, is a helpful thing. Um, I, I certainly plan on emphasizing the major points of, of this policy document to, uh, in the release of, of the neutral report. Um, but any suggestions you might have, Suresh, would be, would be very welcome. You know, one of the things that I've uh, opined on over the years is, you know, you try to convince, motivate action one of two ways, either because it's straightforwardly, obviously, the right thing to do yeah. by a variety of metrics. Sometimes that works. In other cases, you motivate it because they may or not not necessarily see the um, the imperative, but they recognize that it's in their interest right. to do that thing, right? And both are effective strategies to get action. I suspect most of us in academia tend to to fall into the first category that 
we'll explain to you the logic of our position and of course you will immediately grasp that and pursue it. And if you don't, we'll explain it in more detail right. and you will immediately grasp it and pursue that. It doesn't work that way in real life, right. uh, which is what I often describe as the academic fallacy. So how we cast this in terms that gets political traction, I think is, is really important. And that speaks to in some sense the competitiveness and national security issues right. because those I think are the things that will get political traction and from that we then get the ethical values that we think are important and so right. that I, I think is sort of broadly how we need to, my humble opinion would be how we strategize around that. So, so Maureen to your question how do we do that I think um, you know the reports are so great and yet who conveys it is important and I think the, so the messengers are important in my mind. I first thought maybe we take this to the AAU and APLU presidents and such and see if they can all add their voice. But really, we want CEOs of companies to add their voices to this thing. So um, perhaps it's through Dario's uh, committee or something. But uh, I, I'm not suggesting we've not done this, but maybe a, a careful sort of layout of a fertilization plan, if you will, or essentially getting the word out and who gets the word out. You know, with chips and science, at least we tried a little bit to get a bunch of CEOs to sign on. I mean, talent is the treasure to be used by whom? By and large, by these companies, right? I mean, right. of course, universities use it too. So maybe we should think through how to get a few influential, you know, Sundar Pichai and some of these kinds of folks to pick that up if we can, or the IBM CEO or whatever else. But so, thanks. so we do have some comments on, on this. I could just expand what the, what the plans are for the rollout. Uh, we actually will be doing the virtual press briefing that we do every cycle. So uh, pre-release so that they will be ready to release their stories when the embargo lifts on March 13. Uh, we also, for the first time ever, are planning to um, do the big public briefing at OSTP, which has invited the board to do the release there. So uh, it certainly has the potential to have a real big oomph. Uh, there'll be the in-person option and everyone in the world can tune in virtually. That's the plan. And then finally, we are bringing back the in-person public briefings that we did pre-pandemic on the Hill, both Senate and House side. Um, so that's just sort of the short snapshot. So at the OSTP briefing, is it possible? Can we try to get a couple of influential CEOs to be there? Yes. In fact, we sent a proposed invite list just yesterday, and uh, they'll be weighing in as well to add to that. Yes. Yeah, I, I agree that getting leaders in the private sector is critically important. The other thing is, I think we, given where we are in the world, I think we absolutely have to play the national security card as well. And so DOD, um, you know, the private sector that connects with national security strongly, um, because there's a huge imperative there. And I mean, Marvie's going to talk a little more about that later, but, um, but both sides, it, because the security of the nation depends both on economic security and national security defense. Just want to echo what you said, Julia. Um, uh, the national security thing, we've heard that for two years, and it covers everything that we have talked about today from Antarctica to graduate fellowships. One good piece of news um, for Nadine is after Dan and I talked to APLU to the VPRs yesterday, one of the things they're going to consider is once indicators is released, is putting out a joint statement in mm. support of that. Okay, so that's all the VPRs for, for the public universities. And also to mention the important point, which I think they're now getting convinced to, is that research is important, but it's inextricably linked to workforce development, and that particularly the national security sector needs our help. And in terms of public universities, where a lot of them are either EPSCO or they've gotten the RIEs, they've got to go back to their 1862 slash 1890 roots in terms of helping the communities. So kind of taking Ponce, your line, we, we left with them, the thing you like to say about bench to benefits. Okay, got to get to that. So they're thinking about putting out a joint uh, statement after, you know, we release our indicators. That's wonderful. Good, excellent news. Thank you. Um, any other further thoughts, ideas, comments? Particularly focused on the release of this companion piece, if, if uh, because we are going to have to have a vote on this. 
today. <laughs> so so any any uh, like now, <laughs> any burning issues, it would be helpful to discuss them so that people can vote on a proposal that it would incorporate any of their concerns. All right, well, I, I really endorse everything that everyone has said about the, the importance of, I hate to say the negative messaging, but the, the messaging that really rings an alarm that, that this is not just our opinion, but it is actually something that impacts national security, something that impacts, impacts economic welfare and our competitiveness in an international uh, uh, forum. I think, I think all three of those are gonna be important things for us. And in addition to, it's the right thing to do. So, yep, Deborah. Um, I think that's right. But one of the things I've been thinking a lot about that we've talked about here is that every time we impress upon everybody the serious problems we face, we end up recycling some of the same solutions that have not worked in the past. So I realize that may not be the mandate of this report, but I wonder what we might be doing to ensure that the reaction to this doesn't just recycle things that have been tried every decade and don't really help. Hmm. And I wonder, like, maybe that's a broader broad board question, but I've been thinking quite a lot about this, and I think I raised this last time as well. So that's not really about what we're saying here, because it is important for people to see what the problems are, but I'm not sure it's helping them think about, A, what has caused them, or because of that, therefore, what it is that would help to address them. And that mm -hmm. does feel like it's in our scope somehow. So we've we've talked multiple times, largely on your inspiration, Deborah, um, about putting together sort of best practice recommendations. I mean, is that something that we can feasibly entertain in terms of uh, getting getting uh, an actual sort of short list of these are the things that have been tried and haven't worked. And these are the things that have been tried and have worked. And it may be not as um, sort of binary as that. It may be things that make sense to be trying, but what hasn't happened is what it would ensure those things actually working. An example of that would be the repeated investments in curriculum materials, K-12, that curriculum materials don't teach, right. and yet that's one of the easiest things to keep investing in, and they don't actually produce the results. But curriculum materials do matter. So I can imagine a, a, some kind of research-based, evidence-based report that suggests why certain things do keep coming up. Investing in teacher training, of course, makes a difference, but it doesn't necessarily work in the way that it's been implemented. So it might not be like, this never worked, now we need whole new things. It could be, we need to think of new things, and we need to think what has not worked about the things that make sense to us to try. What do we know about what it would take for them to work? I think that's still sort of what you're saying. I'm just saying it may not be throw all that out and do something new. It might be why have the things that we keep trying not been actually addressing the problem? Right. And I do think we could produce such a list. Marvin? I, I suggest also that um, I think we try really hard to keep the conversation positive by saying, okay, let's, let's figure out what are best practices. Um, and perhaps we should also venture into let's figure out what are lessons learned uh, from the past that might have not been the best practices, right? Um, both uh, sides of the message are are important. Maybe that's a way to convey Deb's message. Yeah, I agree, and I think that's kind of what Deborah is also saying that that there there may be approaches that in general are a good idea, but their implementation has been flawed, or or the funding has been inadequate, or the duration has been too short to really see an impact. And so we don't want we don't want say teacher training to be thrown out the window because in some cases it's been ineffective. <clears throat> because you know there may be reasons why it has been ineffective. So, so lessons learned: um, what we've tried that we know works, what we've tried but maybe not in quite the right way, what we've tried and you know seems to to not be effective. All right. Well, go ahead. No, I just want to uh, say that's great piece of work. Having watched this for ten years now, <laughs> and every iteration is better than the previous iteration, clearly. But what I find is that the amount of uptake in terms of what the, we present through these reports um, has not increased a whole lot. So in terms of implementation, action items that come out of this that we can actually make happen, I think the more we are able to do it in this situation, I think it will be more valuable. Um, for example, uh, would you say that industry, you were talking about industry CEOs being there. What do we want industry to do? Yes, they are the people who are the people who take all the talent, but what do we want them to do? Do we want them to more partner with uh, you know, agencies or uh, academia? 
to towards what end. These are kinds of things that helpful suggestions that come out of it, not as part of the report, but a follow on action set of, yeah. set of action items. I think we'll make this report, all the efforts that have gone into producing this report, being useful for the longer term, not just the immediate uptake that happens typically with the media. Right. I think Suresh was intending to have people from the private sector amplify the message, have, have them add their weight behind the importance of and the need for a focus on, on talent. But in terms of what you want them to do, I think that is actually a really important question. But that could be the one, two, three, four, or five punch where maybe <laughs> they support the event and then um, we continue to work with them about how to partner and, you know, are they going to add, are they going to double help us double the GFRPs or, you know, GRFPs or something like that. So I think that can be a follow-up thing too, but um, I think as part of this to come up with um, ideal solutions, if you will, or right. at least uh, solutions to this thing. Right. How can we work together to make this happen? Well, um, I agree. Useful? I agree with you, Suresh, that, I mean, it's a well-established psychological principle that, that um, if you can convince someone to do a small favor for you, they are more likely to, to ally to your cause and to give you a big favor in the future. Right. So, so I think getting industry to, to, or industry leaders to, to commit to amplifying and supporting the message at the beginning will will make them more likely and more inclined to it, it puts it on people's radar and allows them to look to, to commit more fully to to actually being partners and so maybe that is the third or fourth punch down the road so all right well thank you um, oh wait there's more oh all right i just like to briefly add on the ee committee we're also thinking about engaging local like state and local governments too because some of the data is very relevant for them also so that's to just to add on to that. Thank you. Okay. okay. Yeah, anybody else? All right, Maureen, please go ahead. Well, thank you, everyone. I am going to hand the floor back to Dan for a vote. All right. Oh, Mel? I just wanted to remark that in search of techniques to implement a solution, one has to look for robust techniques. It can't be that if you get exactly this amount of money and you do it exactly this way with exactly these people, then it will work. It has to be subject to perturbation and still work. Yeah. Thank you for that. Okay. Um, as uh, SEPs reported to the full board, a policy companion brief to the Science and Engineering Indicators 2024 release, pending minor edits. Remember Maureen's admonition to send uh, any comments quickly. Uh, is there a motion to approve? So moved. Thank you. A second? A second. All right. Um, with a motion and a second on the floor to approve the policy companion brief, Treas talent is the treasure as presented and pending minor edits. Is there any further discussion? All right. The motion before the board uh, is to vote on the policy companion brief as presented pending minor edits. Uh, please uh, make sure your audio is not muted. All those in favor say aye. 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 All opposed say nay. Any abstentions? All right, motion carried. Thank you. Yay. Well, thank you um, for, for your support and all of the work that everyone has put into making this document and making the message get out clearly. Uh, so my next item is a brief report out on committee discussions with NCSCS on potential changes to indicators uh, structure and approach in 2026. So we are likely headed towards a vote on these changes at our May board meeting and also maybe a more extensive presentation from NCSCS. Uh, so I think what would be helpful at this juncture for us is to uh, People have voiced concerns. We don't need to necessarily revisit those concerns, but but you know, if if anything in particular seems to us as a board to be important, to, as a message for NCSCS and as a input early on in this sort of remodeling process, uh, it would be helpful to have it out on the table now. So at our last SEP committee meeting, the NCSCS shared uh, and SEP members discussed a draft plan to streamline the reports and to make the data more accessible. 
So the goal is to make indicators maximally useful for everyone, uh, our current stakeholders, and to expand the scope of stakeholders in the future. The NCSES proposal included a vision for maintaining relevancy and maintaining breadth and depth uh, by strategically choosing uh, the product in which policy relevant indicators are presented. Proposed products are three thematic reports, one on talent, one on discovery, and one on translation. One summary report, which is congressionally mandated, the state of US science and engineering. Uh, data dashboards that will be um, piloted in 2026 and continue to be improved in future cycles. And a number, of, <laughs> the number yet to be determined, of short sort of quick turnaround publications on timely topics. So one of the big advantages in my mind of moving indicators to a short, a smaller format and a more electronic format is exactly the responsiveness that that will enable. Uh, when data appears and needs to be commented upon or amplified, we'll, we'll have the opportunity to do that and the bandwidth to do it. So committee discussions were generally uh, enthusiastic. More information on how current indicators would be crosswalked into the thematic reports will be key for our committee to discuss in the future. So this is upcoming from NCSES, sort of a, uh, a lookup table of how what's currently in indicators would map to these three shorter reports without expanding them to the same length as the current nine reports. And I think some novel uh, analytic approaches such as indices that provide policymakers and other readers with a strong sense of how US science and engineering enterprise is positioned in a global context would further strengthen the vision. So if there is if any other committee members would like to add uh, comments or thoughts or reflections on our discussion for the board in general, that would be helpful. Or if there's any further board discussion, of things that are important to note at this early stage. Any uh, comments or questions? Suresh, your hand is still up. Was that from the previous? Okay, okay Joey. I was just going to say, let's move forward. That's about it. All right, <laughs> Julia? <laughs> Um, I think it's very important for us to understand a little more about how the, the the taxonomy between what's being done now and what is envisioned in the future. Right. Um, also, I have I am not aware that there has been engagement with current or prospective stakeholders about about this, and I think that feedback would be very important as well. Um, I think we were pretty careful about doing that when we went from the nice, easy to read. 2000 page version to what we have now. And I think this other one, I mean, it's a really drastic reduction in terms of what kind of automatically gets put in front of people while other stuff does remain accessible. And so getting getting stakeholder feedback is going to be very important. And so I think there's a lot of information that the committee and then by extension, potentially the board needs before we're going to be prepared to make a decision. Well, well noted, thank you. I mean, I, I just want to emphasize, uh, and Vic and I heard yesterday as we met with the Senate Commerce Committee, they uh, offered that they referenced indicators multiple times per week. So there's a great tendency to think this is uh, a set of data that doesn't get used. It really does get used. Mm -hmm. I would also recommend everybody to use the dashboard and then send your to your colleagues and everything. That is rich amount of data. You can extract that also. But not everybody uses it the same way and you need to pay attention to those that don't use it exactly the way you do. Agreed. So, but I'm only just <laughs> saying that more people start using. That's about <laughs> my request. All right. Well, thank you all for the discussion. Um, I think we have, finally, we're going to have report outs from the policy uh, team leads, so our national security and talent teams. I'd also like to thank these teams very deeply for all of the work that uh, fed into our policy companion document. So first, Marvi, heading up the national security policy team. Marvi? Thanks, Maureen. Um, so just, um, just, so yes, just to go Maureen, ahead, Rich. One last thing. Um, the indicators are not very easy to use for someone who's trying from um, scratch. I was wondering if we might have a little tutorial video or something mm. that's on the website. Um, 
you know, it have to. It would it would take a lot of care to get it right, but it has to be short. You know, three minutes or so, but done well in terms of hey, here's all the kinds of things you can get from here. Here's the kind of ways you could use it, mm -hmm. um, and the way to do it is to you know just a little bit of navigation and uh, help, perhaps a resource or two if you're having trouble getting through, you know. I, calls, I think that's very, very doable. I mean, when we released the state indicators dashboard, um, they did, we did produce a little tutorial exactly like that. That was, I think about five minutes. It, it just walked people through some, you know, if you were interested in doing this, that, and the other, or this is basic navigation, and here's some examples of things that you can pull out. So I think we're well positioned to put together something like that. It's a great suggestion. Okay, here we go. So um, as a reminder, the science and engineering policy team asked our working group to identify one to two topics on national security and the science and engineering enterprise and to incubate policy ideas in those topic areas. Our national security STEM talent working group has pursued this quest in two fronts. The urgent need for STEM workforce with security clearance and the importance of foreign-born STEM talent to U.S. national security. We have been pursuing this goal for the past months and contributed to the board's ideas for input into the Office of Science and Technology Policy, Quadrennial Science and Technology Review, um, and also into top-line recommendations included in the talent um, is the treasure brief we just discussed. Today, I'd like to share some of our team's thinking with all of you to spark an open discussion. So I am expecting participation, okay? So my goal is to get your participation and perspective on this topic as the board prepares to deliver indicators 2024 and accompanying policy recommendations. Your perspective can drive policy messages um, that the National Science Board would want to include in the rollout effort. After this meeting, the plan is to consolidate all of the ideas. Of course, this is still in discussion, right? And to distill them um, for consensus, you know, for items to include. First, I believe there is a strong agreement in that the STEM pipeline is critical to our economic development and our national security. The first question is how can we best understand workforce demand? Then how can we ensure that our country has a <coughs> robust workforce for science and engineering jobs directly working to secure the national defense? In the context of both of these concerns, to further characterize vulnerabilities and to develop evidence-based policies to mitigate them, we can develop and implement systems dynamics strategies for talent recruitment by strengthening statistical and understanding. I'm talking about fact finding. And also, um, I'm also talking about predicting the STEM workforce via integrated mathematical models. Federal agencies could or can partner um, in the development, deployment, and replication of incentives programs for students to complete their bachelor's in STEM areas and to join national security fields. Examples of these incentives are loan forgiveness programs, um, housing down payments for years of service, and, and such. Federal government, um, the federal government could develop or can develop programs that can incentivize partnerships across universities industry and the Department of Defense that accelerates master's and PhD programs while maintaining high training standards. I do think we have a major opportunity for improved understanding of STEM workforce, including the technical workforce needs through the National Sec uh, Secure Data uh, service pilot that NCSES is standing up and I look forward to seeing what's possible there. I know Vic in this board, um, one of our working group members, has a lot of, uh, you know, passion um, in making sure that we have the appropriate supply for our clear technical workforce. Vic, do you want to comment? Sure. Thank you, Marvi. Um, the skilled technical workforce, 
every time we go up on the hill, the we are we hear that the board is really commended for what we have done with the skilled technical workforce and putting workforce up there. Um, putting aside the political polarizations, this is one thing workforce development at all levels. They commend the board and both sides of the aisle are on and they recognize it is both an economic as well as national security challenge. Two years ago, a Maria Zuber, who we all know here, said, fine, you're working well in that, but a bigger problem for national security is a clear technical workforce because these folks have to be US citizens. And so one of the things, been in a couple of meetings, both Dan and I, as well, I've been in a lot of DOD meetings, is you hear things at very high levels. We need 3 million workers for AI. We need 2 million for <coughs> cybersecurity. But at what level is that? Because, for example, to maintain, again, the large language models that people are talking about and people are talking about hacking and hallucinations that you will see in that, maybe those are people who need one degree level or certification as opposed to those who will be developing those systems to protect it, okay, or advance it in terms of research. And so one of the things I've talked to Marvi and proposed is that what we might want to do as we did with the STW many years ago is we need to go and listen and ask some pointed questions to the national security sector. So not just only the government, but in fact, the industrial base, because it will also help us give credibility to what we're doing with both EPSCOR and RIE, because in a lot of the places where these awards have been, there is also a national security feature to that. So that's where we've been having those conversations. If we're talking 3 million cybersecurity, who's that for? Is that Space Force? Is that Air Force? How much of that does Boeing need? How much of that does Lockheed Martin need? How much is that affected in other parts of both DOD, DHS, and the national security sector? Thank you, Marvin. Thank you, Vic. Any other comments from the board on this topic? Uh, Marie, maybe just uh, maybe just a quick comment. I'm not sure if we are getting there uh, or not yet. But um, one of the topics we have kind of heavily discussed in uh, in our meetings is the fact that other nations are well ahead of us, right? If you look at Canada, if you look at Australia, they already have those policies um, for the for last couple of years, and uh, they focus on on um, I would say early um, retention. So when when students are still in the grad school, they can get potentially residency. Um, and again, <clears throat> we can probably reasonably easy um, duplicate those efforts here. But like I said, if there's an urgency because we are already competing with places which are very established and a little bit more friendly, so to speak. One other item we also emphasize, and I think this is also in SEP indicators, is to um, is to look for talent in those emerging economies, right? We've been classically looking for India and China for so many years, and we are almost exclusively dependent on those. So I think it was a great um, recommendation coming out of the group, which again aligns with what uh, Maureen was saying today. Let's look into other um, I would, other geographies, really. Those emerging economies has enormous talent. And if you look at the average age in South America or Africa, <laughs> It speaks the volume, right? We are missing millions there as well, not just in this country. Are there other comments, ideas? Yes, go ahead, Srech. So, Mari, thank you. And uh, this aligns with our OSTP's release of emerging technologies just uh, last week also. It, uh, your idea of getting a, like a mathematical model of demand and supply would be very nice too, so that we can forecast where we need to invest on this particular technology. So I think that discussion, we can have more on that. Yeah, just very quickly and actually playing off of um, and expanding on what Dorota was talking about a little bit, the looking more broadly um, at the emerging economies and our partners of the future. If you look at the list that's in the draft policy uh, companion, that's an interesting collection of countries, and actually some of them are probably viewed at least as negatively as China right now. Um, and so, and and you also look that group, you see a lot of shifting sands there, which suggests you want diversity in terms of where you are placing your bets for international talent. So, so I think that needs to be a piece that we haven't explicitly mentioned, aside from getting away from the huge dependence we have on two countries right now. But as you broaden, don't just pick a couple, just be much broader in, in your purview. 
Other thoughts, Sretch? I'm curious if this is an NSB thing or if there are specific things you're proposing NSF can do in those spaces. There are very good reasons why we used to have Japanese students and Japan got very affluent, we, that stopped, and South Korea and that stopped. Well, it didn't completely stop, but China and then <clears throat> India, et cetera. There are many reasons why we get a lot of students from those countries. Part of the reason being the population is being very high. <laughs> are you proposing something that NSF should or could do to expand recruitment from some of the countries that you mentioned? So the the first um, idea of you know the the recommendations that we can provide because oh, understand that these recommend you know potential recommendations that are still in discussion and very much in draft right um, is to actually understand um, much better the the mathematical problem and um, you know put it on the record that um, it is my very nerdy way to solve the problem, right? So start with understanding the data. Um, and so um, this idea of actually um, intersecting systems dynamics and data analytics to um, understand at a national level, um, supply and demand of workforce in critical areas in a way that you could um, actually make decisions based on not just the correlations of the data in the past, but also potential predictions, right? Which will be, you know, uh, something to venture forward um, is um, something that I believe we should invest on, right? So th there's that, on it's utilizing data to make decisions. Um, and then after that um, is what can we, so we as a board, uh, we have, um, of course, the resp responsibility to provide oversight to NSF, but we also have the responsibility to provide policy recommendations. And so when we see the data from indicators and when we see, you know, the, the position that we are today, a delicate position um, in where, where we are in terms of STEM talent and how we are nurturing in some cases or not, right, um, our STEM talent, then the next thing is how do you react to that um, information? Um, there are two, basically, uh, these pieces of recommendations are bucketed in two different ways. First is domestic talent and what do you do, um, you know, short and long term um, when it comes to domestic talent, these partnerships with universities. And then um, the the second uh, side of this, which is actually I'm about to talk about this, and I'm glad that Julia Dorota actually brought it up too, um, is how do you consider the importance of foreign talent and what are the policy recommendations, you know, or potential policy recommendations there? That's great. I just, when you mentioned decisions, you know, we're not making the decisions here. Correct. Right? We provide so recommendations on the-, the on Well, I, I mean, the U.S. isn't making these decisions. Um, broadly. And so, I mean, we used to have amazing students from Venezuela once at one point, and it doesn't happen anymore <laughs> for good reason, right? So I, I guess I want to keep the um, keep in mind as we make proposals, where is this controlled? I mean, wh you know, yeah. what makes it happen? What would drive it? I mean, Kendra, for example, does a great job of working with coordinations or whatever else and and you know, on cooperative agreements and things, but those are not going to move this needle that much. So I, I'm just curious about big changes in these numbers and how one can bring those about, or, you know, is it feasible for us to, we, after all, NSF doesn't support international students even, right? So. It's a free market, right? So um, academic, academia is not really a, an exception. And the most important thing actually is for the U.S. Um, education system to continue to be as attractive as it is, right? And, you know, you can contribute to that, Suresh, right? And so the idea is... Um, <laughs> the, the idea, so the idea is that to continue to um, actually make sure that that the education system is as attractive. But like you can, um, there there are policies that we have that can um, help us, or you know maybe be obstacles, right, to understanding how open we are to the expansion of in enforcement, you know, reinforcement of our STEM workforce. <laughs> 
Uh, yeah, just uh, a comment and a question, probably question most, uh, mostly to uh, to Punch, to your um, to your comment, Suresh, what are the mechanisms we could use or what NSF could do? And I, I, I recall we had a briefing about the global centers a couple of months ago, right? And I think it's a potentially fantastic platform for us to consider of extend, to extend this from the initial suspect, so to speak. But again, I'm not familiar enough to to suggest if any what policy needs to be changed and who needs to be influenced to allow NSF to expand this group of partnerships yeah. to those emerging economies. So let me be very clear about this. NSF does support international students because people who get grants in universities do hire international students. We don't support them directly. We don't give them mm -hmm. fellowships, if that's what we are talking about, yeah. or NRT or things like that, that is only reserved for US citizens and permanent residents. And so in the global centers, NSF again supports the US investigators who again can hire students that they need for them to conduct their research. So we are not restricting them in that sense, except for GRF fees, that's true. GRF fees are things that we have a very clear ex expectation that it is for, um, for US citizens. But let me ask you this question. We get 20,000 GRFP applications domestically or, or close to that kind of numbers. We're able to fund maybe 12,000, 10,000, whatever the number is. But we fund only 2,000 domestic students who are all very good, who are all very good. I wish that we had more money. How do I make the case for GRFP being extended to international students, right? If the, the, it, It's a problem with the size of budgets that we yeah. have. So we do support international mm -hmm. students. We do support them through a different mechanism, not through these mechanisms. Now, just, just a quick comment. I mean, we had this discussion earlier today before lunch, shortage of workforce in AI. I mean, this is your first aspect, right? Can we um, justify this for national security purpose? I mean, there are a number of areas when we can ask for more money to NSF, right, specifically to increase the pool, because if we now are spreading the same, uh, the same bucket of money to, let's say, incentivize AI, right, then we are losing it other areas. So, uh, right. again... I'm not a I'm not a proponent of always give us more money, but we need to also think how to spend this money in the better, more effective way. So I think both I both us. Uh, totally, I agree with you. This is where, and I was asking the question. It was more a, a question. When we're talking about industry, we should challenge our industry partners, right, to co-invest. And in the GRFP program, if they were to co-invest, and that resources can be used for hiring students. That industry needs to be successful in these areas too. So I think we need to think what we can do within NSF. I agree with you, Dorota, we should not give up, um, but uh, in creative ways of saying what are the special areas that we need more emphasis. But I think we should also think about what other mechanisms right. where we can hire these people in a short order. Yeah. I, I agree. I mean, I think I think the investment from <clears throat> industry would be extremely helpful. And and relatively speaking, it's a it's a small ask. I mean, we're we're not we would not need I mean, supporting students is is a, a fairly low budget <laughs> um, uh, requirement or or request for for many industries where they have a direct interest in in making that happen. All right. In the interest of time, I think we're going to move on to. Well, we got one no, more. Oh, one more from, question wait, from can Scott. We have okay. Half Scott. of the report too. Oh, no. oh yes. Well, okay. <laughs> Just <in touch. laughs> the discussion. <laughs> Uh -oh. so <laughs> Thanks, Beth. So I was a reviewer on the STEM labor force, and one of my top level asks was, can we get a number for demand right. at, at the top STEM level? Because the content, while it was great, just talks about the demographic mix. Yeah. And we know anecdotally we would like more STEM graduates in any number of fields, but just to use round numbers, if we graduate 1,000 STEM undergraduates, we don't know if the demand is 1.3 million or 1.01 million. Right. If we want to make an impact to get more money for fellowships, to uh, on any number of things, we need to know that demand. Um, I was very glad to hear you saying, look, we need to understand exactly what the need is, but that's a subset of the larger picture at the top level of, do we have the capacity academically to produce that number uh, of graduates? Yeah. Um, no matter who pays for it. Yeah. Right, so, and, and in addition, it totally does not incorporate the, the question of future demand. I mean, what is the projected growth of these fields? And, you know, because we need to be training people now for what the need will be five years from now. Right. 
certainly we can backfill um, in that piece. Okay, um, Marvie has indicated she still has half of her report to, no, it's, to, it's to go through. Half. It's less than half. <laughs> but, right. And, and so, I'll just encourage us to, to try to be brief because we're already yes. behind schedule and we right. need, yeah. Yeah, um, the discussion is, what's else on the agenda. The discussion was encouraged. I appreciate it and the discussion is important. Um, on, the, um, on the demand versus supply, remember that the demand actually comes from both commercial and defense. And your commercial demand actually affects um, basically what you can supply for your um, defense, you know, uh, demand. Okay, so um, so the the nation, you know, or I, I should say, I should start with this. The board has been sharing for many years that foreign-born um, STEM talent is of immense value uh, to the U.S. science and engineering enterprise. Um, the nation is so reliant on this talent in numbers um, that continuing to attract and retain talent is a national security imperative. As the work um, of the external engagement committee has made clear, our dependence on foreign talent in critical fields is actually a serious risk to our country. So this is true in STEM fields, um, but it's particularly, particularly acute um, in many fields underlying critical and emerging technologies such as advanced computing, AI, advanced energy, en en um, engineering materials, and quantum information, and so on. A key entry point is um, students and trainees who come to the US uh, to learn um, and generally have a high, high rates in the US STEM workforce, as we have mentioned before. This is especially true for postgraduates, masters, and PhDs. As you have seen in the talent is treasure, one of the ideas is to proactively broaden the talent pool attracted to the US uh, to study and train. Ways to pursue this goal is to first align, um, potentially to align um, strategies for attracting and retaining foreign born STEM talent with evidence-based projections of workforce needs um, and the evaluation of other countries' practices and policies, just as Dorota mentioned before, um, especially in critical and emerging technologies. Um, another potential idea um, that has surfaced in our discussions is to improve retention of international STEM talent by increasing H-1B visa numbers in critical and emerging technology areas uh, strategically, right? Um, and this way we recruit students in earlier in their studies by simplifying, streamlining, currently lengthy, lengthy processes without sacrificing security streamlining processes and leveraging national waiver processes. So, um, and finally, to uh, perhaps think about broadening the international talent pool, as it was mentioned before, I believe, by Julia and also Dorota, um, especially in emerging science partner countries and strategic collaborators. So these are some of the topics that we have been discussing um, in our committee. I really thank um, the committee members. This is actually a, a small, um, uh, a tiny and mighty team, uh, the national security team, and all of your contributions um, are and inputs have been great. Um, are there any other comments that um, you for for committee members that you would like to share at this moment? Um, and, and my committee members are Julia, um, Suresh. Dorota and Vic. Wanda has had her hand. Go ahead, yeah. Wanda. Just very briefly, in response to your request for full board participation, thank you for the document that you've prepared. A lot of it has spoke has focused on uh, attracting and retaining foreign-born talent. One of the things that the foundation has addressed for years is the benefit of what's been referred to as brain circulation versus brain drain, and that is the benefit, even to U.S. security, of foreign-born students who are trained in the U.S. at the highest level, and for whatever reason, return either to their home or go elsewhere. But there can still be some benefits to our national security by keeping consideration of brain circulation. Thank you. Thank you, Wanda. Okay, I'll return the discussion to you, Maureen. Thank you, Marvie, and thank you, everyone, um, for the very helpful discussion. Um, I'm going to turn the floor over to uh, Julia for the talent development team. Are there questions? <laughs> <laughs> okay, um, 
Well, half, almost half the board is on the talent development team, which is a remarkable demonstration of the importance that the board attaches to it. Uh, specifically, we have Vic, Suresh Babu, Deborah, Bev, Vicky, Marvie, Kayvon, Matt, and Mel, um, plus myself. So it is nearly half of the board. Uh, we are divided into uh, several groups and um, focusing on uh, Pre-K through 12, uh, STEM education, uh, that sort of follows up on the ESCI um, work. The financial obstacles to getting a STEM bachelor's degree, the role of community colleges in growing the STEM workforce um, all the way from skilled technical workforce to um, advanced courses for high school students in underserved areas to um, those heading on to bachelor's degrees and beyond. Um, and uh, we've co and and then specifically uh, um, focusing on the skilled technical workforce. So we've co we're covering a lot, and we are very much focused on both the identification of relevant data and analysis um, of that data available as we move forward. Um, in the interest of time, I'm going to um, and and we've been fairly quiescent since the last meeting um, because of all of the work on indicators and the national security effort. Um, however, we are going to be ramping up and the one um, effort that they would have loved to have yesterday if we had had it is um, a, um, a complement to the previous work that's been done on the skilled technical workforce. Um, I'm not going, you have ac ready access to the previous report, so I'm not going to go over that right now. Um, there's been a lot of progress on the four recommendations that came out with that report. Um, and um, just as one example, we're building out stronger um, NCSES data sets so that we can more care. Uh, fully characterize and track the skilled technical workforce. Um, and certainly what you saw in this cycle of indicators is a dramatic expansion over what was available in previous versions. Um, STW is central to conversations around the STEM, uh, domestic STEM talent um, on Capitol Hill, um, here, and everything in between. And um, so the um, at this point, it is appropriate to um, grow and revamp um, the message, revisit the message that we had before and perhaps expand it. Um, and that it, um, team, it, the subgroup working on that is um, led by Vic and also has Kayvon and, uh, Kayvon and myself on it. Um, and so we will be, um, you will be seeing something on that in the relatively near future. Um, and we hope to have draft text by the end of this month. Um, and a mock-up that will be hitting um, your inboxes for a vote before very long um, after it goes through SEP. Um, so uh, thanks very much. And uh, in the interest of time, that concludes my report, unless there are comments or questions. Any quick comments or questions? If not, thank you so much, Julia. And um, Mr. Chair, this concludes my report. Thank you, uh, Maureen, and thanks to everyone for that thoughtful discussion. Um, workforce is the uh, it's the engine that drives everything. People people are um, the, the mechanism that everything happens, and so it's critical that we ensure we have an adequate supply of talent. Uh, as I sometimes tell people, by definition, well-educated, talented people are always in short supply, um, and advantage accrues to those regions and societies that uh, capture a disproportionate uh, percentage of that talent. And uh, that's what we have to continue to focus on, which is a good segue actually to our next conversation, uh, which is uh, we're gonna hear a presentation from NSF's Chief Diversity and Inclusion Officer, uh, Chuck Barber. And Chuck was, we'd hoped he would be here at the previous meeting, but, um, some unexpected circumstances intruded, but we're delighted that uh, he is, is here today. Um, you know, it's worth remembering that the CDIO position uh, was required as part of the Chips and Science Act. Um, and uh, Chuck is gonna offer some perspectives on um, strategy uh, as we work on the missing millions in STEM meeting NSF's agency priority goals and meeting new EPSCOR targets uh, and a whole host of other things uh, as well. And Chuck, I'd like to ex explicitly thank you for meeting with MRX 
uh, and uh, providing your impact on the broader impacts criterion. Um, and I'm going to hand the floor over to Chuck, who's going to do yet another, or to Ponch, who's going to do yet another introduction of Chuck. No, I think I'll keep it floor. short. I mean, we're very fortunate to have Chuck's leadership uh, as a CDIO of NSF. He's already put in place a number of things that's really changing. I mean, I would, I would say underlying culture of the institution itself being elevated, and through that, a number of these important issues that, that Chuck is addressing. But I would be remiss if I didn't say that already Chuck, in a short time, has been looked upon as somebody that, you know, you know, uh, OMB, I mean, OPM, OMB, and uh, other agencies look up to, and, and the Hill look up to in terms of how to frame all of this the right way to get the outcomes we seek. Over to you, Chuck. Thank you so much. Can you all hear me okay? Mm hmm Click is not working. Oh. I want y'all to see all of that, yeah. All right. Um, so good afternoon, um, and I'll try to, my best to be concise and be mindful of the time. But um, as Dan said, I was supposed to have this conversation with you in December, and unfortunately I was, wasn't able to, but I am very grateful uh, to be here with you this afternoon. And I'm going to anchor just a little bit on this first slide here, because um, uh, this, this slide here is going to kind of set the stage for the rest of the, the, rest of the conversation. Uh, but as you all are aware, we're in the middle of some interesting times. Uh, DEI laws continue to pop up across the country, uh, and when I checked this morning, we are at 73 bills introduced across about 26 states right now. Um, that and the, the, the SCOTUS decision on affirmative action, uh, and then to kind of add to the, to the compounding complexity, language in this space changes so much that we can never have consensus on what's truly acceptable or, or what's appropriate. And so when you think about all of these things, um, given the amplified complexity and the sensitivity, uh, how do we future-proof this work so that it is sustainable and so that this work is not just a moment in time, but a movement in time? Um, in my humble opinion, you know, it, it starts with the focus on organizational change needed to really get to those outcomes that we're seeking. Uh, we're going to have to get to a point to where we view DEIA as the outcome and not the process. You know, and when we can have that North Star mindset, it's easy to unify others into looking at how we um, assess our policy instruments for any unintended consequences, how we move past just looking at diversity by the numbers and, and start to look at underrepresentation as a leveling strategy uh, and also as an equity issue in our talent management systems. Uh, it's also been, been able to leverage that full spectrum of diverse talent that society has to offer within our organizations uh, to be a part of those decision-making conversations, those problem-solving strategies um, and, and other operational discussions. Uh, and then, you know, DEIA is more than just an acronym. It's a gateway to psychological safety and the organizational change work needed to really get to those outcomes that we're, that we're uh, seeking. Um, and, and DEIA also helps to link this work to culture. Culture is the underpinning to everything that we're doing here with DEI work. And it's also the underpinning of what we're doing with organizational uh, effectiveness. You know, I was, I was keeping a tick mark back in the back of the room about how many times I heard the word culture or DEIA mentioned today, it was mentioned quite a bit. You know, and so when you kind of think about some of those things, you know, and, and packaging these things into a, a culture strategy, um, that's, that's how we move past, you know, looking at this work simply as remedy work, but more so as that structural diversity work really um, move, to move us in the direction to get to the impact we want to achieve. Uh, it's also about using data. Uh, both quantitative and qualitative data to make sure that these conversations are evidence-based and not just, not just opinion-based. Uh, and it's also about how do we make this data actionable. And so, and I'm going to get into this, you know, on subsequent slides, uh, but we've developed two models to kind of help us get to this. And I know Marvie's going to get really excited about this because she and I have talked about this pretty extensively. Uh, but one of those models is a maturity model. You know, and that maturity model is basically, it's a, it's a five-phase continuum that uses both quantitative and qualitative data uh, and about 30 pieces of assessment criteria to really assess the efficacy of DEIA capabilities within the organization. And I'm going to get into that a little bit more uh, detailed as we progress through the, through the slides here. Uh, then we've also developed an underrepresentation tool. Um, and this is, this is one of the efforts that I'm probably the, the most proud of uh, because we've basically taken every job series within the federal government and linked them to analogs provided by the American Community Survey, the Bureau of Labor Statistics, and the Department of Labor and now we can tell you the level of diversity that can be achieved if that segment of society were available at the national level, at the state level, and all the way down to the niche occupational specialty level. 
Uh, we've also incorporated a predictive analytic because we've baked in historical workforce information and projected census and projected BLS information. Uh, now we can tell you when we, when we can reach population parity for each one of those job series as well. So it, it's, a, it's a really powerful framework. Um, and then to kind of get around some of the legal scrutiny, um, and Ponch, I probably asked for forgiveness uh, for doing it, but I took that model over to the DC courts and I briefed it to the chief justices because I wanted to get their reaction to, uh, to, to whether or not that tool would be perceived as uh, affirmative action or quotas. You know, and when I kind of walked them through, you know, how we've looked at uh, researching, you know, 30, 40 years of case law uh, and having good conversations with Angel, who's in the back of the room, who keeps me, who keeps me honest from a, from a legal perspective. Uh, and that model was very well received. Uh, you know, we were able to kind of message it, you know, to, to demonstrate how it was in the, uh, the spirit of the SCOTUS decision on affirmative action. And so uh, just thinking about how you can kind of navigate the legal challenges and the, and the scrutiny, uh, that becomes even more important, particularly as we want to diversify uh, our, our STEM talent. Um, you know, and, and before I move to the next slide, you know, I, I would also kind of say, you know, I had an opportunity to brief the Bay Area Conference last year, thanks to Vic. Vic signs me up for a lot of stuff, and I never can say no to Vic. Um, you know, and, and, and one of the things that, yeah. yeah. And one of the things I said to that group was, you know, everybody in that room kind of represents civic symbols of democracy. You know, and, and, and as civic symbols of democracy, you know, we can all show love and pride for this country while we reconcile for past indiscretions and, and vice versa. You know, and so as I kind of think about that in the vein of, of polarity thinking, um, that's, that's where we're taking most of the things that you're hearing me talk about today. Um, and I won't, I won't get into this again, but the, the, this is the underrepresentation model you just kind of heard me talking about, you know, and, and, and I have a data visual on the next slide that kind of demonstrates how we're initially pulling all this data together and, and, and maybe at an appropriate time, I can actually demonstrate the tool to you. So you can kind of see, you know, how the confidence factors and how all of those things come into play. And I also want to thank uh, Ms. Amilda Rivers and her team from SES in the back of the room too, because uh, they are helping to ensure that we put in the level, the level of rigor and discipline, you know, as, as we build these tools out. So just, just superb collaboration across the agency as we, as we kind of build this out. But, but, and, and thinking about some of the congressional scrutiny. Uh, we also have to generate on an annual basis something called a Management Directive 715 report. And that's basically a report that, that depicts uh, participation rates by, by grade levels and occupational specialties. And so what we've done with this tool is we kind of built that tool so that it kind of serves as a bolt-on cap capability to the MD 715 report. You know, and so linking that model to a congressionally mandated report, you know, that just kind of helps you to really, you know, get around the, the, the scrutiny. Um, in, in a recent conversation I had with the, with Secretary Del Toro over at the Navy, you know, one of the things I kind of mentioned to him was, uh, if, he said, well, Chuck, if you had to give me an elevator speech about the tool, what would it be? And I said, well, the tool basically helps you to harmonize diversity and meritocracy without compromising one for the other. You know, this is, this is a, this is, this cannot be an instance anymore where it has to be one or the other. This is another example of polarity thinking where it can be both and. You know, so harmonizing diversity and meritocracy without compromising one for the other. Um, and, you know, in this tool, it, it walks you through a series of steps where it kind of enhances barrier analysis. So, you know, when you run the, when you run the information, and let's just say if you're underrepresented in females for a particular uh, engineering capability, well, the model is going to ask you to go and look at your historical hiring trends. Did you have a chance to leverage any um, hiring flexibilities or any targeted hiring events? Uh, it's also going to tell you to go and compare your position descriptions or your job criteria with what we see in the federal government to what you see in the private sector. Do you have an opportunity to modernize your position descriptions? And when you look at it from that approach, this tool kind of helps the agency stay competitive with the private sector because it's modernizing the workforce. Uh, from an organizational culture and, and, and climate perspective, it's, it's also going to tell you to go and take a look to see if this particular Occupational specialty, has it been subjected to a high number of sexual harassment complaints or, or other types of uh, complaint systems? And so uh, it, it really does a good job of really taking barrier analysis uh, to, to the next level. And so, uh, and, and hopefully you all can see this, this chart uh, okay, but this chart kind of represents what, a, what our initial data visuals look like. They've kind of progressed a little bit since we've developed this, but uh, as you take a look at this, uh, this, this represents uh, 
the black and African Americans here at the National Science Foundation in all of our STEM specialties. Now we can absolutely disaggregate the data, but just for the sake of conversation today, we aggregated the information just so you can just kind of see uh, how the information kind of kind of falls out. The blue bar represents what the benchmark would look like once you integrate all the data within the Bureau of Labor Statistics, Department of Labor. Um, and, and right now you see it as a static benchmark. It's showing you 3.7%. Well, we've kind of advanced this a little bit. So now that, that projected benchmark is dynamic now. So it kind of changes over time uh, based on how we have the data put together. But as you look at this, uh, as you look out through 2030, based off of historical hiring trends and, and, and the information pulled together, you can see that that gap is gonna increase over time if we don't do something about it. So uh, here's where our partnership with NCSES has become just so invaluable because we've, they've, they've given us uh, a research methodology to kind of help us refine this a bit. And so we've looked at four levers that we can pull that will change the, project, the trajectory of when we'll reach population parity. And so uh, if, you, if, you, if you look at a position description update or if you look at a targeting hiring event or a policy update, how does it change the trajectory over time? Now, we, we don't want to just keep putting this data together and just put it on a slide and admiring the data. We, we need to make it actionable and putting some controls into the fabric of the organization to really get to the point where we can start to make some change over time. We all know that diversity is a deliberate outcome that won't happen overnight, but I'm, but I'm confident that with some of these controls that we're putting in place with the focus on organizational change, it'll absolutely make a difference. Um, I should probably also note um, that, you know, Bev, um, gave us, an, and also Dr. Cook from APLU, Bev gave me an opportunity to pitch some of these models in front of the ASEE, you know, back in the fall. And, and you know, this information was, was very well received. And, and, and I think we're gonna adopt some of these methodologies to look at how we do some assessment in our engineering community. So, so really excited about that. I say that because, you know, these models are not just applicable in the government sector. It can be used in the academic sector as well and in the private sector as well. And so uh, with, with our partnerships, we hope to absolutely hope to expand some of, the, some of this work. Uh, the next model that I want to talk to you about is a maturity model. Um, and, and so this maturity model is designed to really help organizations uh, better operationalize uh, inclusion. Um, and, and I don't want to use um, inclusion and belonging interchangeably. You know, inclusion is that signature behavior that we want to see. Belonging is the outcome that we want to get to. You know, and so this model is intended to really kind of help organizations get to that shift to move through the continuum. Uh, and, and the model has five phases. It has a uh, compliance, which is that um, basic DEIA understanding, and then it moves you up through evolving, acceptance, cohesive, and inclusive. Uh, you know, and so once an organization runs through the mechanics of the model, the model is going to generate an assessment report, and it's going to show um, how they rate in the policy area, how they rate in the talent management area, uh, how they rate in the operational capabilities area, and how they rate in culture. And then the model is going to aggregate all that information. It's going to show you where you fall on a continuum, which I'll show you on the next graphic of what the continuum looks like. But the, but the model doesn't just stop there. It also generates a get well plan to help move organizations from compliance to fully inclusive. Now, I had an opportunity to uh, deploy this model with the, with the Department of the Navy. And when we first did it, I think we launched it across 20 uh, naval commands, and, and on average, they all feel right in the middle in the acceptance range uh, when we first launched it. Well, each one of those organizations, they took the get well plan that the model generates, and then we went back and did a, a subsequent assessment. It was between six to nine months later, and each one of those organizations had moved to the right. And the, the, the department average moved from acceptance to cohesive within a nine month span. And so I was, I was real proud of that. Uh, I, I kind of look at this model also like a reversible t-shirt. Because while I can assess at the organizational level, we can also assess at the individual leader level as well. We, we developed a tool called the Leadership Reflection Tool. And, uh, and kudos to Janice, who's sitting in the room, because her, her organization was the first organization to pilot the Leadership Reflection Tool. And, and Janice, I'll report to you today that we've now moved from it being an automated PDF to it's now fully automated in Qualtrics. You know, and so uh, it, it's, it's my hope that once we continue to integrate these models with our partners over in HRM, that maybe this may be a tool that we can bake in to be a part of executive development programs and a part of training curriculum to kind of really help to really build and bolster uh, inclusive leadership uh, across the foundation. Uh, there's probably another area that I want to really kind of touch on that you don't hear a lot of CEOs talk much about, but Rhonda and I have a conversation about this pretty regularly, and that's the way that this leadership reflection tool is established. It does a really good job of operationalized restorative practice. 
because there's a very strong self-awareness and self-reflection component with this tool, which, which are centered to, to, to really been able to demonstrate what a restorative practice looks like. Uh, and before I move off of this slide, you know, you see a little bullet on here that talks about soldier initiatives, sexual orientation and gender identity initiatives. You know, we, we talk a lot about having gaps with how we're able to capture SOGI data to really look at barriers for the LGBTQ community. Well, part of it is because we haven't done our jobs with really making the environment comfortable enough for members of that community to want to report sexual orientation or gender identity. You know, and so uh, one of the goals of this model is to really do a better job to help really refine the, the environment to make our community more comfortable so they are comfortable with, 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 with reporting. And we're in partnership with OPM because OPM is looking at NSF to really help them define some policy recommendations um, to how the entire government can capture SOGI data uh, over time. And so we're really excited about this, about this initiative. So here's, here's what the continuum looks like. You kind of heard me talk about the five phases. Um, and again, once an organization goes through the mechanics, they'll get a, they'll get a report that shows exactly where they fall on this continuum. And, you, and there's definitions you know, here for each one of these uh, phases, and I'm happy to provide additional information because I know it's hard to read on a slide, but this just kind of gives you, gives you a sense of, of, of what I mean when I say moving an organization from the left to further in the right uh, on the continuum. All right. Um, you heard me mention earlier about culture being the underpinning to all we do, you know, whether it's linking this work, DEI work to culture, or whether it's trying to improve organizational effectiveness. And so uh, here at NSF, we recently just launched a culture assessment here at NSF, you know, and we had an opportunity to, to gain insights into uh, what we can do to, a, to, a, to review our mission statement and, and some of our strategic planning to ensure that we have complete alignment as we move forward. Uh, we got some insight into how we can improve consistency, you know, so we got some opportunities to really incorporate some process governance to increase transparency and even build trust here across the agency. Uh, involvement, you know, that's that's very closely linked to to inclusion. And I won't dig into to that a bit more, but we have opportunities to improve there as well. And then adaptability, you know, how are we really responding to emerging requirements or changing in the environment, you know, and so um, we're going to have an opportunity to brief these results to our workforce early next week. But I'm really proud of uh, our leader, our EOT leadership that's sitting in the back of the room because, you know, in order for us to, to get better, you know, we have to get real about the challenges that we face in order to, to get to that point where we're getting better. And so this is a good first step in how, what we're doing here at NSF to really improve uh, organizational effectiveness and ensure that we give our workforce the right resources to be successful uh, in what they do on a day-to-day -day basis. All right. Oh, yes, ma'am. So thank you so much. It was really a great presentation, and I love, love the approach. You know, being a geek and having mathematical models. I got one more slide. The, oh, I'm sorry. I'll be quick, though, and I'll come right to you. Uh, I, I, I did want to also kind of highlight how we're having these conversations with other federal agencies. You know, and so on a, on a monthly basis, you know, I have conversations with uh, NIST, NASA, DOD, NIH, you know, and we talk about the same things that I've kind of put in place uh, and what I've kind of briefed to you today. You know, these are also things we're considering to see how we can broaden across, you know, uh, uh, our partners with, within the federal government as well. And so, you know, you know, Ponch, you know, we talk a lot about, you know, creating opportunities everywhere, you know, and so when I'm talking to this group, um, I talk, I always say, hey, well, we want to create opportunities everywhere for everybody. You know, I just kind of broaden that statement a little bit, you know, and so to continue to have those conversations with my partners and my other CDIO uh, colleagues, uh, that, that's real important. Uh, and now we're to the point now we're also having conversations with OSTP so we can consider how we can formalize uh, some of the informal conversations that we've been having. And so I've talked enough this afternoon. You're probably tired of hearing the, the country twang. So I will pause and ma'am, I'll come back to you. I know you had a, you had a question. Uh, yes, thank you. Um, no, we are not ever tired of listening about this great <laughs> stuff. Um, I was just wondering if you can comment on this. So you, you discussed this five-step model, right? Mm -hmm. How do we know when the organization transition between those steps? And when do you think, or maybe you know for sure, where NSF is now in the scale of one to five? And plus, you know, I also appreciate a lot your explanation of certain terms because I noticed that... Um, 
in some academic circles now people don't use word inclusion because belonging is preferred but you made it very clear that a mindset of inclusion transitions to the mindset of culture of belonging right so yeah. great thank you so much for explanation yeah i'll tell you um i'm a stickler for differentiating a measure of performance from a measure of effectiveness right. you know and so you'll hear me talk a lot about being outcome-based thinking uh and so differentiating inclusion for belonging really it falls into that vein um, now back to your question about you know understanding when the organizations transition, uh, it's, it's going to be different for for other organizations. You know when I launched this, you know at the Department of the Navy, um, some organizations were eager to be reassessed within six months. Some wanted to wait nine months. Some wanted to wait twelve months. You know, um, it's it's important. You know when we when we walk organizations through the mechanics of that model, I don't want them to think that this is an I gotcha test, or or another compliance drill. This is Chuck Barber and his team walking shoulder to shoulder with you to help you get better, you know, and so um, just depending on the leadership's priorities, you know, and I don't ever want to be disruptive when we're, when we're doing this kind of work, but I let them decide when they want me to come back in and make that assessment. Uh, but but the model does a really good job of showing um, how you've made progress, you know, between between assessment cycles. So um, the, the criteria we got, I, we just read a, wrote a 50 page technical manual that walks you through the mechanics, the criteria. Uh, the approach to how we do it, you know, and so it's 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 a very rigorous approach, you know, with with how we make those make those assessments. And 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 it, I can't say where NSF is right now because we haven't launched this. You know, at NSF we we have a number of initiatives in play right now. Um, you know, we just we launched the culture uh, assessment, we launched the Fez survey results, we got some pulse results. You know, and I, I we don't want to survey fatigue the organization, you know, or, or get to that point. But but I do want to get to a point to where you know, with Ponch and Karen's approval, I want to get to the point where we do like a, a top level maturity model assessment to kind of really see, you know, where we, where we fall as an agency. And so maybe once we get that done, I'll be happy to report back to you so you can see where, we're, where we fall. So, so Chuck, yes, thanks sir. again. Uh, great presentation. Um, you, you mentioned just now sort of performance versus um, effectiveness or something like that, essentially inputs versus outputs. And so um, I'm curious, on, on, on campuses, for example, our campus, we do a, a climate survey. Mm -hmm. And, you know, we try to do it and, and look at the results longitudinally and see at least directionally whether we're going in the right direction or not, et cetera. There are sort of confounding factors in those things, though. So, for example, if we make it, as we have recently, much, much easier to report bias um, or report sexual harassment and such earlier, you get an uptick of, of reports. So I guess all that to say, I'm curious how, um, how accurately you think one can assess the impact of the things you're doing, especially because there's so much, there's so much granularity to it. There's so many elements of it. How do we know those things are working, I guess? Yeah, there's. I, I think regardless of what we do, we're going to have some conjecture. You know, I, I you know I won't just sit here and not say that, that we probably won't. But I, I, I think we have to continuously assess not just organizational climate, but also organizational culture. You know, you know, one is going to show the perceptions of of, of how an employee feels uh, about the organization, and, and one is going to talk more about the experience. You know, I, and I think through continuous assessment through those, you know, I, I think you're going to see some trends, you know, and I'll just think, just in thinking about our FEVs results and our culture results that we did here, while the measurement approach was different for both instruments, you definitely see some trends, you know, in, in both instruments that, that we can work on. And so um, it's, it's just a matter of continuously being able to, to, to look at both of those areas and just really identifying those trends, that driver analysis, you know, that's really going to drive some of those changes within your organization. Just for people, mm -hmm. FEVS is Federal Employee Viewpoint Survey. Mm -hmm. I'm sorry FEVS. about the acronym. So is there, is there such a thing as sort of survey um, fatigue? I mean, how often can you actually survey people? Yeah, I think, I think there, is a, a, there is survey fatigue, you know, but, but I think, I think what, what we have to be able to do is, is really show how we're making outputs of those surveys actionable. You know, so we, we can't just have the workforce take the survey and then not be able to talk actions, you know, about what we're taking. And so... You know, one of the things that Karen is pushing me to do is, you know, develop a reporting mechanism. So once we develop that agency level action plan uh, to be able to report back to the workforce on a continuous basis, hey, we heard you. 
here's what we're doing about it. You know, and so just been able to kind of, and I'll, I'll give you an example. We la- I first launched this same culture model at the Defense Logistics Agency back in 2013. And the first year I did it, the response rate was about 40%. Uh, and I did it on an 18-month cycle, you know, and, and then really showing the outputs of those action plans. Uh, by the time I left DLA in 2018, the response rate went up to 75%. You know, and so I, I think showing the, the actionable piece, I think that's important. <coughs> yes, ma'am. Uh, just, can, I'm sorry. Uh, just a general reminder, please raise your virtual hand because people are jumping ahead of other folks who have been waiting patiently. So, um, Irene, uh, and then Wanda, and then um, Deborah. So, thank you. Thank you for your report, and I love your graphics. Um, I'm curious, given the the rise over the last several years in anti-Semitic, uh, anti-Islamic, and anti-Christian harassment, bigotry, and bias, and even violence. Um, a very large percentage of Americans, maybe 70%, identify with one of those three groups. Uh, what, what, if anything, is NSF doing kind of analogous to SOGI initiatives? Maybe there should be a, a ROFI, you know, religious yeah. aso- <laughs> association and faith identity or something initiative to, to try to address the concerns of people who, who in many cases really do feel very frightened in some environments because of their religious affiliation. Yeah, you, you know, and I'll also tell you, you're, you're touching on a really key point as to why, you know, eventually we'll have to move away from the acronyms and start to look at this more so as culture writ large, um, that for that very exact reason, because we're, we're, we're going to run the risk of excluding a group or, or leaving a group out if, if we don't do that eventually. Um, we, we, we had some recent conversations with OPM about that, to be honest with you, because I think a lot of organizations across the government are struggling with how to address the topic that you just raised. And so it, it's my hope that as we continue those conversations, we'll put some concrete things in place that we can't actually address it uh, in the midst of the scrutiny that's, that's, that's in the middle of it as well. So uh, hopefully I'll have a better answer for you next time we can, next time we can talk. Briefly, thanks very much, uh, Chuck, for this very forward-looking, uh, evidence-based approach to the DEIA issue. It's it's quite informative. I was really struck by your characterization of this uh, being a gateway to psychological safety. I think that captures things very, very nicely, uh, and those from diverse backgrounds can inherently uh, resonate to that. Uh, also, like uh, your uh, characterization of using data quantitatively, quantifiably, qualitatively, and actionably. Yes, the ma'am. actionable part is especially important. I have one simple question. You passingly mentioned that a demo exists. Is it possible to have access uh, to that demo so that one could see it in action? I don't know if you have a link or anything like that. Well, Wanda knows I'm not going to say no to her either. Uh, so, Wanda, we'll get you a demo, I promise you. Yes, ma'am. Yeah, thank you so much for that presentation. I have a couple of questions. Yes, ma'am. Um, first, um, when you do these surveys, do you disaggregate by identity? Because at, at the university level, when we do that, we see very different results in terms of how the climate and culture is interpreted, depending on someone's uh, identity. And I missed other, the question. You said disaggregate by? By identity, by race. We disaggregate by race, um, division, office head. There's a lot of disaggregation levels. So do you, we, see, do you see differences? We often see major differences by group. Uh, we do. Uh, but again, we're, we're still in the, in the early stages of, of really dissecting the analysis you know, of those results. But, but we absolutely do see some trends in all the different disaggregation uh, approaches that we've, that we've taken. Yes, ma'am. So that probably will be important in order to not... Um, mute the effects on for different groups or different people or different offices, like you said. The second question I have is that it seems like what I thought was going to present us, well, let me put it this way. There are different kinds of arguments that can be made for diversity. We've been talking more about inclusion and culture here. But when I think about the teacher workforce, for example, which is something I spend a lot of time looking at and why it's important to have a more diverse teacher workforce, there are both extremely strong arguments for that that are subtle and important, and there's some that are sort of just taken for granted. And I'm just curious what the argument is that's being made across this for why it's important to be diversifying 
um, both, you know, in all these sectors, what the argument for diversity is, because I couldn't quite figure that out, whether it was just assumed that it was better, but if so, what are the, what's the reasoning being pushed for this? And I, if that's not clear, I can explain. Uh, it is very clear okay. because the business case comes up in every conversation that, that I have. And, and I'll be honest with you, that's, that's also one of the reasons why I put the organizational effectiveness model in place, because uh, once I continue to pull the levers on the underrepresentation model and some of the other things that's going to help to diversify the workforce here, then we're going to see changes in the organizational effectiveness model as well. Um, yeah, we can we can we can talk until we're blue in the face about you know how diversity improves business, how it improves readiness. Um, but I'll also want to make sure that we keep that humanity piece at the at the front of it too. Um, but but I don't have the data for you right now. But, but I think over time we will have it. But I think there is a business case to be made how diversity does improve organizational effectiveness. Dr. Dr. Barbara, thank you very much. So uh, I have a question with reference to, we started off with love for each other and let's move forward. I really liked it. Thank you for doing that, yeah. telling that. So then and along that way, you said that through collaboration and dialogue, we can develop a culture. So what is the best practice or tactical way to do it in an organization? So can you kind of share some of the best practices? Because with all this social media going on, I, how do we get this dialogue going? So, In, in terms of increasing, increasing the uh, awareness of where we are, how to improve together, and all those things. Yeah, so I, I, keep, I keep going back to, again, about how you future-proof this work. You know, and so linking, linking the work more so to culture um, you know, to me, that, that kind of helps to remove any perception of this work being divisive or any perception of the work being solely focused on, on, on activism. Um, and, and I will tell you, when I've had conversations with, 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 with folks on the Hill, whether it's on the left or on the right, you know, and, and, and linking the conversation more so to culture, it, it's always so much well received. I, I don't think I can stress enough that culture truly is the underpinning, you know, to, to all we do here. Um, you know, and, and I'll always talk about the models, you know, that they, they don't have anything to do with quotas or affirmative action. You know, this is about how you help the organization remain competitive for the sake of national security, for the sake of ex advancing science, you know. And so um, just, just keeping the conversation, again, data to make it evidence-based, uh, that, that always helps. And I hope that answered your, answered your question. It's more informal collaboration within an organization, like like every day. Oh. How do we in for in, increase that amount of dialogue and collaboration? Well, well, I'll tell you. You know, with everything that you saw here, you know, it's, it, it can't be the office of the CIO doing it alone. I mean, it's going to take OGC, it's going to take OECR, it's going to take our HR shop, it's going to take NCSES. You know, and just you know, and so, you know, having that north star with harmonizing diversity and meritocracy. You know that 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 keeps us all rowing together. That that kind of helps us unify. You know, with the work that conversations with Irwin, with James Moore. You know, it's 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 all of us doing it. You know, and so, you know, having that North Star thinking, that outcome based thinking, that that's that's what keeps it all unified. Thank you. Yeah. All right, Marvy, uh, and then Dorada, and then Marlon. So um, first of all, thank you for appealing to my nerdy <laughs> side, um, and actually building, you know, a database a model to um, go about the problem right in a way that we can use data um, to make decisions. Second, my second question, or, or maybe challenge point for you, was going to be, you know, start with a why, which you did. Um, and then my third point was going to be like, what are you doing to actually collaborate with other agencies, which you mentioned too. And I, you know, I actually don't have any other questions yeah. Um, because, yeah, cause I, I really wanted to point this out. This is actually an important moment um, for me anyway, uh, because I can see how you are taking and learning from the different um, meetings that we have had and how you're taking the inputs from the board and building something that is powerful, informative, and that people can use to actually make decisions. So, yeah. you know, congratulations on your work. And I, I think it's it's pretty cool and excellent. Thank you. Yeah, Marvy, you know, you, you, you hit on something important. I don't want to give you ammunition for a question for sure. Uh, but but we're also with this work, we're also collaborating with the academic community as well because uh, the University of Arkansas, with me being from Arkansas, and, and Dan has the same ties that I have. Yeah. But they asked us, they asked me to author a, a, an open textbook 
you know, that, that's going to be used across the country. So these concepts that you heard me talk about, um, these things are going to be published in an open textbook that not just federal agencies, but other academic institutions can, can use as well. Yeah, you even at the end of oh, some of your comments, you actually mentioned culture too, which is also something that yeah. if for data oriented people, we forget that it's actually all about yeah. culture. So all points taken and yeah. all points marked. All right. <laughs> Oh, it just was just a comment for Deborah, but he, but she left. I thought she was asking for some um, documented um, proof, scientific proof of value <laughs> of diversity. I mean, there's a series of McKinsey yeah. reports, and there are numbers there which are very very telling. But I'll I'll send her an email. Yeah. Uh, you alluded earlier a couple of times that you saw some common trends in the assessment. I'm curious, can you give a, give an example of one, or maybe some factors associated with those? And the only reason why I'm asking that, because I feel like if we can address that, it would be helpful for the different agencies that have that common trend. Yeah, you know, one one key trend, you know, and this is particularly with um, with how we have to respond to, you know, external pressures uh, and things of that nature is um, perceptions of, of, a, of a misalignment in our mission statement. You know, are we are we moving away from basic research? Are we uh, moving more towards in innovation. Well, the answer to all that should be yes. We need all of that, you know. And so, uh, this just kind of gives us an opportunity to collaborate, you know, as a leadership team and as an agency to really look at our mission statement and look at how we're developing our strategic plan to make sure that we remain in alignment. You know, that's to me that's good constructive tension that gives us an opportunity to really improve, you know, uh, how we can how we can move forward. Um, you know, and, and in some cases, you know, uh, you know, as as a leadership team, you know, we we have to make um, decisions, you know, that may not necessarily, um, we might necessarily for the for the for the folks below us may not necessarily have all the the, the factors, all the decision points, you know, and some, with some of the decisions that we make, you know, and and, and in some cases that kind of gives a perception of. Of, of, a, of a gap in leadership trust and things of that nature. And so we have some opportunities, you know, to kind of address uh, how we want to improve leadership and trust, you know, moving forward as well. And so those are just two, two, two key areas. Two, two so, key areas. Vic, so Vic and I are going to take the prerogative of chair and vice chair. I'm going to let him go first and then I'll, I have a, I, I just want to commend you on your presentation, but I also want to share with everybody at the Bayer conference last week, he was on the stage with a representative who has as much money as James Moore, if not more, from the Under Secretary of Defense, from the president of the, the American Chemical Society and a VP from Abbott Labs, because they're all wrestling with this, despite what we hear in the news and things like that. You, your presentation was, presentation was so compelling, as you know, so once you have those seminars, I felt bad for the other people because everybody was lined up. Mm -hmm. to ask him questions. And at this conference, large number of CEOs and VPs, because the whole big thing is about workforce. And to your point is, yes, there's this, all this demand in these areas and the STEM areas, but the issue of culture and how we quantify that and how we quantify how we're making the culture better to have retention and those things are yeah. extremely important. So I commend you on what you've done. Thank you, Vic. I was going to say a version of the same thing, Chuck. Thanks for all you're doing, uh, and maybe a question. You know, obviously, Chips and Science created this new role. Not that the foundation wasn't actively involved in in these areas before, but as you sort of look at the mandate that Chips and Science laid out, uh, what can we most do to help you, and what do you see as the sort of biggest challenges going forward? Well, for me, the biggest challenge is going to be the. Uh, the legal and political scrutiny, you know, I, I, that that is the one thing, Dan, it, that keeps me up at night. You know, I, I even when I'm here at work, I keep the TV on CNN because I want to see what's flashing across the ticker about uh, what state is going to pop up a new law, what law is going to be, you know, what bill is going to be enacted in, into law, you know. And so um, I, I think being able to be uh, involved in discussions like this, you know, with this uh, so much genius in this room, just the support that you give. Um, that's the biggest thing that you can do right now. Um, just continue dialogue. And, and I would say, you know, in, in terms of chips and science, you know, I, I think uh, as my role continues to evolve, you know, I, I think you're going to really start to see um, my role have a, a different balance with what I'm doing internally and, you know, what we're doing externally. My colleagues, Ponch, Karen, they give me a lot of autonomy to, you know, to really do some of the things, you know, from an external perspective, you know, but I think as this role continues to evolve, because it, it's still fairly new, I've only been here for about 13 months now. 
but as the role continues to evolve, I think you're going to really see some some other things, good things come down to down the pipe. All right, thank you. Well, thank you for the presentation. Thanks for the discussion. Um, we are going to take a short break, uh, 10 minutes, uh, and so we'll reconvene at 2.45. Thanks, everyone. It's working fine right now. So I have him on. <laughs> Well, she said it was this one. But this one could be the box. Yeah, look. Yeah. Now that the, the technology is working and those photons and electrons are flowing out there on the interweb, we can we can start. Uh, so welcome back. Um, delighted that uh, Renee Ferranti is here. Uh, she's NSF Special Assistant to the Director for SAFR. And then she just came back from uh, the ICE. Uh, and we're looking forward uh, to hearing her, from her about uh, the trip, about SAFR strategy. And before she jumps in, I'll hand the floor over to Punch for just a moment if you want Thank to Thank you. Add. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Just very quickly, uh, you all know that Renee Ferranti is a Senior Advisor for the SAFR program. It has done a remarkable job in a very short time, including being in the ice for two weeks and the difficult circumstances, I'm sure, um, but has come back with a lot more learnings, but even more importantly, a great partnership with OIG on the ice. And so a lot of things that she's going to share with us today in terms of the status report, as well as where we are heading into the future. So over to you, Renee. Oh, there Sorry about that. So the slides, are they all up there? They're not over here. Oh, there we go. Good afternoon, and thank you for the opportunity to provide an update on our progress to date about the SAFR program, uh, which, I, well, is sexual assault, harassment, prevention, and response, which I will refer to as SAFR, the H being silent, uh, for the rest of the presentation. It's been quite a whirlwind, uh, 100 days-ish. I started just the week before the last uh, meeting with you all and had the opportunity to, to hear some of your thoughts at that time um, and then throw in the holidays and whatnot. And then I did just also get the opportunity to go on the ice. So it has been, I feel like it was just last week we all met. Um, but I'm grateful to share this space with you today. I'll be sharing some operational updates, a synopsis, uh, of my recent trip, as well as our program framework moving forward. I know over the last year, NSF has been working with the board to keep you aware of the progress on NSF's action plan to address the SAPR program, which was the responsibility of the director's task force on SAPR. And over the last few board meetings, we shared with you the intent to develop a strategic framework for the SAPR program that will support an enterprise-wide effort, applicable not only to USAP, but all locations where NSF um, activities are conducted. It's important to broaden our perspective and give it a forward-looking view with respect to our goals, 
And that's what I'll go over with you today during the second half of my presentation. Before I begin, I would like to reiterate the agency's position. First, we recognize that to enable scientists, engineers, and students to work at the outermost frontiers of knowledge, the agency must be a role model for teamwork, fairness, and equity. Investing in science, technology, engineering, and education for the nation's future necessitates a safe environment, free from any form of harassment, and one that fosters equal opportunity for all. And finally, NSF is committed to creating safe and inclusive research environments where everyone can thrive. And I'm honored to follow Dr. Barber, who really laid that foundation during the last presentation as well. So operational updates. To begin, I'd like to touch base on the regular coordination and collaboration that we have with our partners. And to start, the director meets with the director, uh, the CEO of Lidos on the regular basis monthly, Mr. Tom Bell. And this regular contact ensures accountability and the opportunity to share feedback on reporting incidents of sexual assault and harassment. So that regular communication occurs. Additionally, the COO and the Lidos VP with the ACS ASC science and research team meet quarterly. I also had the opportunity to meet with that team just before I left for the ICE. And that was incredibly uh, productive and insightful for me as I'm learning and trying to understand where we started and where we are now. Um, and I was able to hear from that team how they've evolved their, evolved their processes to support the NSF intent. Since I came on board, uh, there has been quite a, uh, quite a bit of coordination and connection with key stakeholders. Most notably, uh, during my trip on the ice, I had the opportunity to meet with the Secretary of the Air Force for Manpower and Reserve Affairs, Mr. Wagner, his deputy, Mr. McIntosh, and their senior military advisor, Colonel Hennigan. I was lucky enough to have the opportunity to spend a few hours with them and tour Scott Base while we discussed the SAPR efforts and how best to collaborate. I actually, um, there's a lot of crossover there. Uh, Mr. Wagner was the chief of staff of the Army when I was still working for uh, the Department of Defense years ago. So I'm very familiar with his initiatives and his um, vision for programs like the Sexual Assault Prevention Response Program within DOD. We have a follow-up meeting scheduled for March 5th at the Pentagon. Also noting that the Colonel hosted an all-female service member luncheon while on ice to get a pulse check. And she advised me that there were no significant concerns from that particular group. Um, she only noted that the limited counseling options, uh, as there's only one licensed counselor on ice at any time. But her and I will continue to sync uh, moving forward as needed. I have met with and will continue hosting quarterly meetings with the Pacific Air Force Sexual Assault Response Coordinator. She's the regional SARC that is responsible for ensuring coordination of care for service member victims in Antarctica. And this was an important connection. Some things have changed since I've worked for the Department of Defense. For example, um, sexual harassment is now a crime under UCMJ, which is very different than obviously what we would, how we would manage something for specific to sexual harassment within for a federal um, a member of the federal service or uh, a contractor or even um, someone from academia. So it, <clears throat> one of the things we want to ensure is communicated is that if the offender of a sexual harassment incident uh, is a service member, that we report it properly through those channels. And of course, if there is a victim of assault or sexual harassment, that we also do that proper coordination. Lastly, I had the opportunity to meet with several Amentum HR representatives, including one of their uh, general counsel, to talk about how we can best coordinate when they receive incidents uh, reported to them directly. The OIG investigator joined me for that meeting as well. And that was also incredibly informative. Um, you know, HR is not, human resources are not necessarily trauma-informed, trained how to investigate these very specialized uh, traumatic incidents. And they expressed concern about wanting more training in that area. So when they do receive disclosures, they know how to manage that appropriately and not cause more harm. They did advise that Lidos had 
provided a, um, a training last year offered to all of the HR personnel. However, it was uh, optional, not required. So I've since shared language with DAX to ensure that we have language in the future contract that does require specific training for our HR personnel, supervisors and managers, as well as the general population, all very role specific to address um, areas of sexual assault and harassment with regard to bystander intervention, reporting, and how to properly respond when you receive a disclosure. So what is working? Um, we know there's been so much effort in the last year and a half put into the SAPR program. How do we know if it's effective or useful or if people are finding it valuable? I was really happy to hear this morning that the feedback uh, from the members sharing their, from their visit that they felt the victim advocate was a very positive aspect that has been added. Um, and I do personally feel that was an incredibly important resource um, and a step in this process. We've also um, implemented the subcontractor and contractor notifications to Safer Science. So to share how that's working, in the last quarter of, uh, or rather FY24 quarter one, so October through December 2023, we received 12 notifications from Lidos using the community incident form that they have developed um, that was provided to Safer Science to ensure there is that streamlined communication and notifications are occurring. This is one of the things I'll continue to work with um, with the ASC uh, Lidos team. In that quarter, we also had three individuals reach out to Safer Science directly, seeking assistance with uh, for information and reporting about available and, and information about available resources. On ice support, again, the victim advocate being a critical element of um, victim and survivor support when they've experienced sexual violence. During that same time, uh, quarter one, the on ice victim advocate had approximately 100 client contacts with the community members. I think that's pretty impressive. Now that's telephonic, in person, virtual, and that does not mean new, client, new incidents or new reports. Those are client contacts of a variety of means. It could be multiple with one person who's come forward, made a report, and then has sought um, you know, support during that process or just a one-stop shop to find out information and resources. It's also worth noting that they shared they also receive inquiries about other issues um, that they've assisted with redirecting an individual to the appropriate HR or other resources as needed, because some folks just don't know how to navigate those various systems on the ice. And again, I think reflecting back to the discussion this morning, that concept of you know, something like an ombudsman, that's where that service would be provided normally. Additionally, from October through January, the on ice victim advocate facilitated 25 in person trainings, reaching approximately 1,400 individuals. They conducted two South Pole visits, totaling 20 days, and conducted numerous work center outreach presentations and dozens of arrival outreach briefs. They are present at every arrival brief, so new deployers can put a face with the role of a victim advocate and start to build that rapport on the front end as soon as someone arrives. This just touches on the level of effort and usage. One area we are actively working on is ensuring standardized definitions and language about sexual assault and sexual harassment across all the notifi notification mechanisms. Internally, with contractors, the many layers of subcontractors, and even <clears throat> within academia. Often some of these definitions vary, and so I, I'm hesitant to say we have, we have to be really careful about stating we have X number of types of reports until we have clear guidelines on that everyone is referring to something the same way. We must all be on the same page when we're talking about this and sharing information. We've shared with you previously that we were pending OMB approval on the US um, USAP Sexual Harassment Sexual Assault Climate Survey. Um, and happy to say we have received, recently received that approval. We are now finalizing the communications for the rollout. We must be very sensitive and mindful about the execution of the survey. We don't wanna cause more harm to those who have been impacted by sexual violence, whether related to NSF or not. 
while it's a climate survey, it is focused on individual experience of sexual assault, sexual harassment, reporting, and safety concerns that occurred while deployed on the ice. But this could certainly trigger historical or other traumas. As a microcosm of society, we know that statistically, many of our community members have experienced some form of trauma, specifically sexual violence. A little later in my presentation, we will talk about the imp importance of being trauma-informed and how that needs to be the approach for all efforts, not just reporting and responding to a victim, but our training, our data collection, our messaging, and how we talk about this in information, uh, how we talk about this issue internally and externally must come through a trauma-informed lens. Lastly, but incredibly important, facilities improvements. We heard some of those concerns this morning, uh, and some of those efforts are actively underway, including the construction of the new dorm, upgrading the existing dorms to include new mattresses and higher quality bedding, the renovation of the chalet, which will provide additional lounge and recreation space, and uh, a new coffee house setting. And finally, the Frosty Boy, the ice cream machine replacement which is called the Spaceman. Um, it arrived with me on my flight, although I take no credit for that. <laughs> so my visit to Antarctica. I have to say, honestly, that's not, those aren't words I ever thought I would say. Although I never thought I'd live in Djibouti for 13 months either. Um, so this was to me almost the polar, liter <laughs> dare I say, the polar opposite. Um, <clears throat> so this transitions perfectly. Uh, as I just returned last week, I had what some would probably say was a true Antarctic experience. My uh, first three days, my first three flights rather, were canceled. Um, so three days in a row, 4 a.m. wake up, and uh, Terry Carpenter can attest to that. We were together during this uh, adventure. Um, on the fourth day, we finally departed. Um, and about five hours into our flight, thinking we were half, more than halfway there, you felt the plane bank and uh, found out we had to turn around. So 10 and a half hours later on a C-130, we're back in Christchurch. So I had the full experience to those in OPP who are laughing in the back. Um, so <clears throat> anyway, you will see in the top corner, uh, the first photo is the spaceman. Um, and you'll see that someone took it so seriously that they constructed a box uh, representing the Frosty Boy with wings and a halo um, representing its passing. Uh, so it's funny that when you're in these in austere environments, um, the little things that become symbolic or iconic even um, to the community, including Ivan the Terabus, which is in the bottom left corner. I had the opportunity to ride on Ivan uh, from the airfield to the station when I arrived. And someone mentioned this morning, uh, sir, I think about the three, three folks from Vermont that you met while in Antarctica. Well, I met two people from Rhode Island, my home state. And I just, I'm like, I don't know who, you know, that was just amazing to me. So back to the program and sharing my experiences. <clears throat> I'd also like to note that four members of the SAPR program staff also conducted visits over October and November, including a visit to Palmer Station. Unfortunately, due to my visit getting cut short um, with the flight delays over, I was not able to get to South Pole as expected. But that's incredibly important to make the community feel heard in all of our locations. So I do hope that's something we can I can do in the future. Uh, but we did have a SAPR member, a SAPR team member um, from OECR attend, uh, or rather go to Palmer Station last year. And I think these visits helped instill some trust in the existence of a program leading up to me arriving. Um, it basically gave people behind this program. It's not just a hotline or the one victim advocate that they see or some obscure email address, but that there are people behind Safer Science, and they are using the community feedback um, to help improve this program. I had the opportunity to have many one-on-one -on -one meetings with uh, community members. Some dropped in during office hours, other directly reached out to me to make sure that we could find an opportunity to connect while I was there. And again, I could hear from them, you know, that, the, the, that they were grateful um, to be heard in that moment. 
Along with the OIG investigators who happened to also arrive uh, because of my delay, they arrived with me um, over on the ice as well. So I, we were able to partner while there. And we met with the medical clinic personnel, including the South Pole physician and the outgoing McMurdo physician. And during that meeting, we were really focused on sexual assault forensic exams, what we would refer to as a safe. So in the unfortunate, horrible event that it's necessary, it is incredibly important that a, a victim of sexual assault has the opportunity to have evidence collected. Um, and that forensic exam, because it is evidence, has we need strong processes for storage, chain of custody, and the coordination with DOJ. So that requires that strong partnership with OIG to make sure all of those things are taken care of and that there's not evidence lost during that process. I also met with the Navy chaplain, the JTF deputy commander, Colonel Ford, spent quite a bit of time with the victim advocate, uh, was able to spend time with the outgoing station manager, the NSF station manager. Unfortunately, his replacement uh, was on the flight in the day I was leaving, so I didn't have the opportunity to meet the incoming. Um, and again, I had the opportunity to meet with the Secretary of the Air Force. Also, uh, I did not mention previously, but Lieutenant General Lowe, the director of the Air National Guard, who's also in the bottom right photo, I was able to, he was part of that group that I was able to spend that time with. And again, talking about the collaboration and how to coordinate um, with the DOD resources. I participated in the NSF town hall, which is really their weekly leadership, uh, leadership meetings, the ASC leadership meetings. I attended two sessions of the SAPR training, re reporting and response training that the victim advocate provides and supported the OIG investigators with an outreach session. This allowed us to show the collaboration between SAPR and OIG so that individuals know that if they come forward to report a sexual assault as a crime, that they also have the SAPR office to support them. And I do want to share my kudos with the Office of Inspector General because the investigator they brought on a few months before I joined NSF, um, Carrie Hartman, she was brought on specifically to address these issues. Um, she's wonderful and well-versed in victim survivor-centered rep responses. Um, and this makes our partnership incredibly prolific. Uh, I've had the unfortunate opportunity to work with some law enforcement or investigators that are not quite as skilled and honestly, that can cause so much more harm in the system, harm to the victim, harm to the whole process. Um, so I'm very, ex it, I'm very excited to have the partnership we have with OIG. We heard a lot of observations this morning from the members on their recent visit. And mine, I really do feel generally aligned with what others shared. And I'd like to continue to stress the concept of prevention as it relates to getting at the root causes of sexual violence. We need to focus on the environment as a whole morale and, and the morale of the community, not just responding to bad actors. If not, you're just, you're never getting ahead of the curve. And I think again, back to Dr. Barber's um, presentation, you know, that, that was very evident in there of how important um, you know, community and diversity and inclusion are. We have to focus on what is within NSF's control and sphere of influence. And we need to strengthen the, impacted, strengthen the support for the impacted person. That needs to be the driving factor for any response, um, which is considered secondary prevention for those, I'm looking at this through a public health model, which we could spend a whole session on talking about. But um, secondary prevention, if an incident occurs, we do not want to re-traumatize or cause more harm. Accountability comes in many different forms and is often unpredictable with personnel actions through HR or law enforcement investigations, prosecutions that may or may not go forward. But what we can absolutely control is that in between portion where an individual feels safe enough to come forward and that we can support them through that process. So the feedback from the monthly meetings with the contractor, the subcontractors, my recent visit, um, and your valuable insight from the recent visits uh, have, all uh, have all validated my vision for the way forward, which I'll share with you now. I'd like to walk you through the components of the framework that I plan to establish, that I'm establishing at NSF. The elements of the framework are driven by evidence and research-informed best practices in the sexual violence field. 
And many of you may be aware that this has evolved over the last couple of decades. We learn and we do better. That's the most important piece. Um, often, unfortunately, learning from survivors who've had these experiences. So what I will be sharing with you is based on my personal experience in multiple federal agencies in a variety of positions, from boots on the ground, first responding in the middle of the night, to program development and oversight. I've worked closely with many other agencies prior to coming, in, coming to NSF and continue to do so, participating on several interagency working groups. The framework includes standards that many of our that have already been implemented across the Department of Defense, NOAA, the Coast Guard, the Peace Corps, USAID, and others. In addition to my experience, the SAPR team members conducted extensive benchmarking across various agencies as well that all support moving in this direction. Additionally, most of these are tied to congressional mandates that have occurred uh, over the last 15 years to those same named um, federal agencies as well. So beginning with the approach. Moving forward, the SAPR program will use the following core expectations to support the development of an enterprise-wide program. Intersectional. We must continue to have intentional, thoughtful coordination and collaboration with OECR, DEI, and DEI to address the root causes of sexual violence. Addressing these issues with a public health prevention lens cannot be done in a vacuum or through one office. It must be a collective effort. And when I say root causes, research globally shows that sexual violence occurs where there is inequity and power dynamics. Our focus on equitable, inclusive research environments supports this approach. We just heard from Dr. Barber about the importance of equity be becoming part of the fabric of our organization. And that contributes to this as well. Response processes will be multidisciplinary it is critical to have everyone who has a role in responding to work, it has a role in responding, working together to ensure the safety of the individual and the community. These efforts span across the program, operational offices, HR, OIG, legal, all is depicted in the graphic. And this is just a quick glance of the internal coordination. As noted previously, we have a lot of external coordination as well. Next, a victim and survivor-centered approach. You see Sapper, again, at the center, somewhat as an umbrella. And we put the victim and survivor at the center of that. We must strive to always place the rights, confidentiality, wishes, needs, safety, and well-being of the victim at the center of all prevention and response efforts. We must promote their autonomy. The various processes and support mechanisms are surrounding the victim in that chart. And it only indicates a few of uh, key response mechanisms currently in place. The criminal justice process, the HR process, medical care, and an access to, an access to the victim advocate who can help navigate these systems. <clears throat> the impacted person needs to know their options and they must drive the train. We must remember that this happened to them, not to us. Last is the trauma-informed programmatic approach. So what does this mean? We could do entire sessions on trauma, being trauma-informed as well. Um, to some, it may just be buzzwords or jargon, but it has been proven to be critical in the field of sexual violence. For those who may not be familiar what it means to be trauma-informed, I encourage you to reflect in your own organizations, because I'm sure that it, it's growing uh, awareness as well there. SAMHSA describes a trauma-informed approach as acknowledging the widespread, widespread impact of trauma and creating a safe environment, physical and emotional safety, and seeks to actively resist re-traumatization to achieve optimal outcomes. So that should always be our goal, to never cause more harm and make every effort to support through a process. Understanding everyone comes to the table with trauma, especially now um, post-COVID, there's all sorts of different traumas individuals have experienced. Um, and that didn't go away just because you get on a flight from Christchurch, even though it does feel like you're kind of leaving. 
We have to ensure all NSF personnel and collateral stakeholders understand the prevalence and impact of trauma and ensure appropriate response to traumatic incidents. When I refer, we must make every effort to protect individuals from re-traumatization. That's why that piece with OIG, when they're investigating or asking questions, doing that through a trauma-informed lens is incredibly important. We must mitigate institutional harm. When I refer to institutional harm or institutional betrayal, research has shown that the response by an institution to sexual violence can often be more harmful than the incident itself. If you reflect back on the media reports, not just NSF media reports, but others, or you think back to the survivor stories from the November meeting, you'll hear how they feel betrayed by the institution that they've chosen to dedicate a portion of their life to not just the incident itself, which is of course horrible and should never happen. But again, what we can control is how we respond to that and support them when something does happen and make every effort to prevent it in the first place. So the foundation, I showed you the approach. Now let's dive into some more tangible aspects of the framework. Comprehensive prevention and response procedures. I really um, big on standards, <laughs> and we need to use standardized language, not just you know from the NSF lens, but ensure that that spreads down through the contractors, subcontractors, and academia when we're communi communicating about this problem. We have to have clearly defined roles and responsibilities for both prevention and response efforts. That transparency we talked about this morning as well. Everyone should know what's going to happen when, if something were to happen to them, when they choose to report, what that process looks like. This begins with our leadership and institutional commitment made by NSF. Prevention must address the attitudes, behaviors, and norms that prevent sexual violence, that promote sexual violence. We can do this by enhancing existing protective factors that support a positive, safe, equitable environment and mitigate the risk factors. And that's back to that intersectional um, approach named on the previous slide. Response procedures, as I said, must be trauma-informed and victim-centered. And that does require a coordinated, multidisciplinary approach to provide optimal support to the individual and assure, ensure accountability. And of course, of course, this must be sustainable. The director and COO have already dedicated staffing, resources, and funding to enhance the capacity of the SAPR program, showing their commitment to ensure that this program and this problem remains a priority for all leaders, managers, and supervisors. We will continue to increase awareness internally and externally with collateral partners and continue to foster meaningful stakeholder relationships that cross academia, military, federal, and civilian partners. And of course, continuous quality improvement. Unfortunately, the work never stops. I would have never thought I'd still be doing this almost 30 years later, and I wish I wasn't, but here we are. We'll continue to use the lessons learned from site visits and actions that have already been taken to help us move forward. Feedback is critical from survivors as well, so that survey, the USAP sexual assault, sexual harassment survey will also help contribute to this process. To determine the effectiveness of the program requires ongoing quality review and the commitment to improve as needed. There will continue to be growing pains because this is incredibly challenging. It's a global pervasive issue with no off the shelf solution. So it's gonna take hard work, continued hard work. So next steps, I've spoken at length through the presentation about the various ways we are currently strengthening and expanding SAPR functions. As we build the program out to include bringing on additional expertise, of course, we will continue to share those milestones with you. To that end, we will continue um, refining and improving reporting and notification processes and follow-up procedures. Just yesterday, the ASC HR rep reached out to share an updated incident, incident notification template that has been revised based on our collaboration. 
We identified gaps and some modifications necessary for them to accurately share information when they receive a report. So that's an example of we're going to keep evolving and improving. I'm working with my colleagues to continue to build on the progress they've made on internal reporting and case management of reports made through the Safer Science email. We're pulling together existing efforts that have been executed by OPP and OECR and others so that SAPR will have so that the SAPR program will have oversight of all victim services and all programmatic efforts. It's important that the SAPR program, which will have the expertise on victim-centered interventions, serves as the single point of focus for any services related to sexual assault and sexual harassment that the NSF provides. I already mentioned the critical partnership with OIG, and we also continue to have regular working group meetings to enhance and ensure that coordinated response. And finally, just an example of the interagency working groups. Next week, USAID is hosting an interagency executive roundtable on sexual misconduct in the federal workplace. This is a, a working group I sat on for the last four years while I was with the Peace Corps and transitioned here and continue to serve um, as well. Uh, and we're coming together next week to talk about the challenges all the federal agencies are facing in this space. Again, especially when sexual harassment is so pervasive and that balance between or de determining those lines between what is a criminal offense versus you know, something that could be handed administratively, that's, ex it, that's really a challenge um, in the federal space. Um, I'll be attending with the COO and the SAPR program manager. And just a quick reminder as I close, we won't be meeting again until May and April is Sexual Assault Awareness Month. And I can guarantee that all of your institutions and organizations will be doing something in honor of Sam. Um, so I urge you to participate. Teal is the color for sexual assault awareness. Wear teal on Tuesdays, wear denim on denim day to su support survivors um, or any of the many other activities, I'm sure. Signing a proclamation, showing your support is incredibly important, not just in April. That's, uh, we should be having this discussion all the time, but any way you can support your organization during April is incredibly helpful. <laughs> And I'll close. Thank you again for this opportunity to share my vision and intent and the support that helps drive, your support that helps drive us do what we need to do for our community. And thank you, Renee. Questions. I see Matt has his hand up. Hi, thank you very much for that. You mentioned, of course, you cannot control accountability, but you certainly do know about it. It's very relevant here. I asked this question last year, but I kind of asked it the wrong way. So just to be clear, I, I do not want any names, no identifying information of anything, not even exact numbers, I mean, just rough numbers here. Over, if you look back over, I guess, the last half a year or whatever time frame you want, you have a rough idea of how many uh, people who you were know, credibly accused for, of, well, like you said, bad actors, credibly accused of sexual harassment, sexual assault, how many of them uh, receive some negative consequences, uh, whatever they might be. For example, maybe they got demoted, maybe there was an official reprimand, were they removed from the ice? Uh, did they make an official apology? to anybody, and this would include, of course, cases that are still in process, so we sure. don't know the outcome. Just a rough estimate of how many people we're talking. And I can't speak to that, unfortunately. I would have to get back to you, but I will share. So, so you some, don't know? I don't know. The, I personally do not know. I'm sure we could glean some of that, but there, again, when we lump things together, when it's administrative versus criminal is a challenge. You could um, lump those together for me. Yeah. Well, I, I'm just giving you some prefacing that like if we were to give numbers that someone Either could one. face accountability through an HR process right. based on performance, they could label it performance based on allegations of others, you know, 
so uh, that's interesting. Performance covers all kind of things. So mm -hmm. we might not ever, nobody might ever know if it was because they were guilty of a sexual harassment or something. Well, as we, long as it didn't rise to a criminal If it doesn't we'll rise to a criminal know. HR, we are unable to find out specifics about HR actions against individuals. Um, or even legally, just in aggregate. We can't even get a statistic of it. I could... I could pull the thread on numbers that we've collected of incidents that we are aware of, and I would have start. to connect to find out if, um, I think the most obvious would be if someone were removed from the ice. Okay. Um, other than that, I, I don't know specific numbers. Okay, but you know of like, is it like but, a half a dozen people who were removed from the ice, some ballpark it or? I really, I can't speak to that. You won't speak I'd to have that. to, I, but it, but not that was, I won't, not zero, I, I personally cannot, I would need to, um, right. to so to, to your that. knowledge, it was not zero though, I guess. To my knowledge, I would, I don't believe it's zero now. And you, you, so you think you could get, I know, realize you might not be the person, but you think you could get that information or somebody could get that information for me? I, I hear the push and I, I just want to caution. You said Please. something that caused me a bit of pause. I'm sorry. Did they require uh, an apology? Do you know how it, that, that would be an incredibly inappropriate thing to do? Oh, um, okay. Then so, well, I just, you know, there's, there's trauma informed ways of having to uh, deal with this. And what I want to shift while account, of course, accountability is incredibly important and it comes in all different forms the SAPR program, if we put the victim at the center of this issue, our goal isn't that end state. That person may not even want to press charges. That person may not even want to pursue a formal report. Understood. They may want to get counseling and continue with their job. They may want to go home and cut their time short. Yeah. They may want to pursue criminal charges. They may not want to pursue criminal charges unfortunately think it's only an HR issue and, you know, find out that, oh no, he's going to, he or she's going to be charged with a crime and be like, I don't want to participate in that process. There's all, none of it is black and white. Um, so I really would be hesitant to give the numbers you're asking for. Okay. That's a good point. This is just a small one. Then do you know, and I think I know the answer, do you know if anybody, this would be like in management or whatever, um, suffered any, any negative consequences at all uh, for retaliating uh, against a, a victim, Sp any, you know, anything. Again, I think in my tenure, I'd have to speak with others if there's awareness of what, in this case, I think if it were internal to NSF, we would have some concrete information we could provide. If it's contractors, I think we would have to look into what legally they'd be able to share. Um, about that type of accountability. I appreciate that very much. Thank you. Okay, if I could follow up just on Matt's question, do you mind? Sure. I'm going, going out of order, but so as ombudsman, one of the advantages of having an office like mine is that is that I can follow up with victims and taking a perfectly victim-led process, determine from them whether they're satisfied with the resolution of their situation. And I think that would speak to to the question that Matt's getting at. However, they the victim chooses to resolve it. Mm -hmm. I, you know, are they satisfied with sure. the the assistance and the services that they received to bring it to a point when when they can say, you know, I'm good with this. I mean, yes, I've had yes. a trauma, but I'm good with how it was handled. I'm good with mm -hmm. how it was resolved, regardless of what that looks like. And and I think this is really important for us to know because we need to have some idea, some objective idea of the effectiveness of the management of this situation sure. through the NSF. So I, I believe that's what Matt's trying to get at. And, mm -hmm. and I think there are ways of doing it that do not impinge on the privacy and security and yes. diversity of, of the ways that victims might choose to resolve it, but nonetheless would provide us as a board with an objective assessment of effectiveness. Sure. And that is, to me, um, I feel like your question was very different than his question. Finding out accountability statistics of an offender, 
um, from an allegation is a very different question than finding out if a victim survivor is satisfied with the services and support they, they were provided. Yeah, well, one of, one of the so, advantages of being an ombudsman is I'm good at translating. <laughs> no, that was, uh, so that was very helpful. If that's your end state or your goal, sir, I, I definitely agree with you and want to get there. I think the USAP survey will help drive us in that direction. Um, I know that uh, Peace Corps and Department of Defense, it's sometimes challenging to get uh, feedback from a victim about the services. You know, we, we had a response quality survey in the Peace Corps that would go out to a victim within two weeks of uh, the time they made a report asking just five top level questions. And it was about that level of, did you feel immediately supported? Did you feel, you know, fear of retaliation uh, when you made your report? Some of those very key questions. And we could gauge, um, unfortunately, very low response rates um, on that type of request. Um, DOD struggled with this for many years, and I don't know if they've reached a point we even tried breaking it down into portions of services. You know, for example, the victim advocate, the medical treatment, the investigator to determine, you know, if each layer was functioning appropriately. Um, and that was very challenging, again, as well with low response rates. But I think as we tighten up our process, that's an area I want to know. We need to know if we're, we're making a valuable impact on the individuals who have had these experiences and can support them. So absolutely, that's a direction I'd like to pull the thread more, but I do feel the question was a little different. Thank you. So I want to make a suggestion here. We're scheduled to go into closed uh, uh, plenary discussion. Uh, and I would suggest, and we're behind schedule, I would suggest we do that. Perhaps if there are other questions, we can follow up then. And so I'm going to ask if, uh, if Andy will uh, uh, move us uh, from open to closed. So hang on while we chase the photons down. Their emphasis on, 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 on how many incidents have been reported since the last six months. And that's reported how to the victim advocate, to law enforcement, to 